It's time to leave. It is time to let go, accelerate, and release. To return to where time has no meaning. Time to unleash. It's time to leave. Time to hold time here and now. This is our time and our space. Time to come back and turn around. Our pace, lost and found. It's time to leave. Time to root for our roots. To stretch the legacy and thicken the plot, ready or not. It is time to enter the outer world, to wow. Not before, nor later. Now. It's time to leave. Time to be whole. To come and stay. To be a passenger, an outsider. Eternal reminder. It is time to be the most of our being. Time to catch up. To sharpen the spirit. It's time to leave. To be left in amazement. And be history. It's time to reach. Olá, muito bom dia a todos. É um gosto ver esta sala completamente cheia uh, para assistir a esta conferência. A primeira edição da Visit Portugal Conference. E realmente está um dia incrível, frio mas com sol, para falarmos de turismo e falarmos de tendências, falarmos dos caminhos para o futuro deste setor tão promissor e que tem contribuído tanto para arrancar e mobilizar a economia portuguesa. Agradeço desde já a presença do Sr. Ministro António Costa Silva, que está aqui connosco, também do Secretário de Estado Nuno Fazenda. Aproveito para os cumprimentar e agradeço o convite ao querido amigo Luís Araújo, Presidente do Instituto de Turismo de Portugal, que tem sabido muito bem levar a bom porto este setor. E é um gosto estar aqui, poder dar o meu contributo humilde, enquanto jornalista, para poder também aprender com aqueles que são os oradores desta manhã. Ora, a conferência do ano é esta, é sobre mercados internacionais e sobre segmentos e tendências no turismo, com o mote Global Tourism Insights. Ao longo do dia teremos connosco especialistas nacionais e internacionais, que aqui já estão nesta sala, para dois grandes momentos nesta sessão. E o primeiro momento é Inspiring the Future, vamos ficar certamente todos muito inspirados para os próximos tempos. Conta com oradores que vêm de diferentes latitudes, geográficas e de conhecimento, eu diria que são oradores arrojados, que nos vão tirar fora da zona de conforto e que nos vão mostrar a sua perspectiva de turismo do futuro. À tarde, o foco será Doing Business, onde diretores das equipas do turismo de Portugal nos mercados externos, juntamente com os seus convidados, com especialistas desses mercados, vão percorrer aqui vários desafios, pistas valiosas para os próximos anos e sobre internacionalização do turismo e também das empresas do setor. Portanto, é um dia que promete, promete ser ser recheado de bons conteúdos, de boas camin bons caminhos, boas pistas valiosas então para definir o futuro de um setor que não para de crescer e não para de nos surpreender e que bom que isso é. Uh, o Luís Araújo Sábio nunca foi uma jornalista que terá escrito em algum momento a turismo mais em Portugal, nunca o fiz, não o farei, julgo que o turismo faz todo ele muita falta em todos os segmentos e é importantíssimo para o desenvolvimento do país, sendo transversal depois o seu contágio a tantas e tantas áreas. Portanto, que bom que é estarmos aqui para celebrar também este setor e estas tendências. Sem mais demoras, vamos avançar nesta sessão e vamos dar as boas-vindas a este palco para a sessão de abertura, precisamente ao Luís Araújo, o Presidente do Turismo de Portugal, que aqui está connosco para este lançamento desta manhã. Luís, muito obrigada. Obrigado, Rosália. Bom dia, good morning, um, Sr. Ministro, Sr. Secretário de Estado, dear guests, speakers and, and other guests, um, it's a pleasure to be here and an honor. And I would like to tell you two things, ou, ou melhor, um, vou voltar ao português, um, porque esta conferência é feita pela diversidade, começamos por aí, portanto, cada pessoa falará no seu idioma, mas em respeito a alguns oradores, vamos tentar fazer aqui um mix entre o português e o inglês. Dizer-vos porque é que é importante esta conferência hoje. Nós temos um objetivo ambicioso, crescer em receitas 
até 2027, estamos a falar de 27 mil milhões de euros de receitas, e é importante estarmos aqui hoje, porque hoje, fechadas as contas de 2022, percebemos que estamos muito mais próximo daquele que é o nosso objetivo. 22 mil milhões de euros, 15,4% de crescimento comparado com 2019 e, essencialmente, uma presença cada vez mais forte. Este é o nosso grande objetivo e foi esta a razão que nos levou a construir este conceito, esta ideia de conferência, partilhar com as empresas, com os empresários, aquilo que é a nossa inspiração para o futuro, mas também o nosso target e o nosso objetivo de alcançarmos estes valores. Mas é também importante hoje, precisamente por isto, a marca Portugal é uma marca valorizada, uma marca líder em transformação, com forças uh, que podem ver aqui, amigável, amável, charmosa, tradicional, divertida na moda, um, mas uma marca que ainda pode reforçar a sua presença internacional. E é isso também que queremos ouvir hoje, com os nossos delegados na parte da tarde, com os seus convidados de cada mercado, que nos possam trazer de que forma é que nós podemos reforçar esta imagem. E se hoje somos uma marca em transformação, podemos ser uma marca com ainda mais valor. E este é o nosso grande objetivo. Uma marca com um estilo autêntica, única, glamourosa e prestigiante. Uma marca que tenha reconhecimento por parte dos mercados internacionais, por parte dos consumidores, mas principalmente uma marca que acrescente mais valor às pessoas, às empresas, àqueles que vivem cá e que dê a melhor experiência a quem vem de fora também. A nossa estratégia passa por cinco eixos. O primeiro tem a ver com o crescer na internacionalização. Precisamos que as empresas portuguesas estejam mais presentes lá fora. Em conjunto, em colaboração. O segundo, crescer em valor. De que forma atingimos mercados diferentes? E é bom perceber que aquilo que antes era a nossa dependência em mais de 60% de mercados, dos quatro principais mercados europeus, hoje está praticamente nos 50%, e isto ainda assim com o crescimento desses mesmos mercados, mas este atingir segmentos mais exigentes com maior elevado poder de compra é algo que também temos que todos fazer em conjunto. Uma terceira questão tem a ver com o crescimento no interior, obviamente um, os destinos tradicionais continuam a crescer e são importantíssimos para a valorização da marca, mas o país como um todo, a nossa diversidade geográfica tem que ser e é promovido com o um objetivo maior de levar turismo a todo o território. O quarto ponto tem a ver com este crescimento na dupla transição. É preciso proteger o planeta e nós precisamos de um turismo melhor para, um, para termos um planeta melhor, mas é preciso também a transição digital e tecnológica um, para que as nossas empresas cheguem mais longe, mas sejam também mais eficientes. É, isso, é disso também que vamos hoje falar aqui nesta conferência. Em resumo, aquilo que nós pretendemos com este encontro, e é isto, é um encontro, antes do nosso principal momento Uh, turística a nível nacional, que é a BTL, que começa amanhã e que é uma época intensa de negócio também, é estimular a internacionalização das empresas. Irmos mais longe e mais para fora, arriscar mais. E isto faz com esta colaboração de todos, mas com muito foco naquilo que nós queremos para o futuro. E arriscar significa precisamente isto. Uh, aquilo que foi feito em Times Square há alguns meses atrás, uh, de levarmos um país uh, à maior praça do mundo, ou levarmos as nossas praças à maior praça do mundo, teve também a sua dose, uh, eu ia dizer de loucura, mas é de risco, uh, mas fez-nos chegar a mais de 370 milhões de pessoas. Uh, o lançamento da campanha Close to Us, Close to US, foi claramente, e é hoje um sucesso, e é destes sucessos, é destas iniciativas que o Turismo Portugal, com a sua equipa, com as suas equipas lá fora, com as 25 delegações, constrói a imagem que vimos, mas principalmente constrói o futuro. 
Um, <clears throat> I would like to finish by thanking all the speakers. Thank you so much uh, for coming today, for sharing your knowledge, for inspiring us. And uh, I think the most important is getting inspiration, especially this morning, and getting knowledge and information, especially this afternoon. Thank you so much once again. Muito obrigado. Espero que seja uma sessão, que sejam sessões muito produtivas uh, e que esta seja a primeira de muitas conferências para que a marca Portugal continue a crescer muito em valor. Muito obrigado. Luís Araújo, Presidente do Turismo de Portugal, muito obrigada por esta introdução. Nesta sessão de abertura temos então aqui as pistas que vão fazer-nos guiar durante o dia nos vários debates, nos vários oradores, mas antes de irmos a debates e a outras sessões, vamos para já convidar o Sr. Ministro da Economia e do Mar para se juntar a nós neste palco e para poder também aqui trazer umas palavras de abertura desta sessão. Seja muito bem-vindo, estamos todos ansiosos por ouvi-lo, saber como é que vai ajudar a dinamizar ainda mais este setor tão relevante para a economia portuguesa. Muito bom dia a todos. Queria saudar o Sr. Secretário de Estado do Turismo, Comércio e Serviços, o Sr. Presidente do Turismo de Portugal, toda a equipa de Turismo de Portugal, os delegados que vieram das várias partes do mundo e queria saudar também os senhores empresários, as empresas que estão aqui e todos aqueles que procuram desenvolver este setor. Eu penso que a primeira questão que queria suscitar é reforçar a mobilização extraordinária que este setor tem. Ele atingiu um máximo no ano 2019, antes da pandemia, com 18.4 mil milhões de euros de receitas e 27 milhões de hóspedes no país. E toda a gente dizia que seria muito difícil nos anos seguintes, sobretudo depois do flagelo que a pandemia infligiu este setor, com a paralisação completa de múltiplas áreas, atividades, desde a restauração, gastronomia e outras, as viagens, e, portanto, toda a gente dizia que seria muito difícil superarmos os números de 2019 nos anos subsequentes. E, portanto, a estimativa é que em três, quatro anos regressássemos a, estes, a esses números extraordinários. Mas que o, o que o setor provou no ano 2022 é que nós conseguimos fazer as coisas. A excelência das empresas, a excelência dos operadores turísticos, a contribuição extraordinária desse grande organismo público, que é o Turismo de Portugal, as políticas de promoção dos mercados externos, tudo isso funcionou. E nós chegamos ao fim do ano de 2022 com 22 mil milhões de euros de receitas e o número de hóspedes a aproximar-se daquilo que foi o objetivo atingido em 2019. Portanto, a minha primeira mensagem, nós conseguimos. Se nós tivermos crença em nós próprios, se trabalharmos de forma articulada, se tivermos capacidade de ação coletiva, se sairmos dos nossos estilos, se sairmos do nosso individualismo congénito e trabalharmos nestas grandes redes colaborativas, o país vai se mover para o futuro e o turismo vai dar uma contribuição inestimável. Portanto, como a Rosália já mencionou, há muita gente no país que ainda não compreendeu a importância que o setor do turismo tem para a economia nacional. E na nossa visão, o turismo é um instrumento para desenvolver as economias locais, para potenciar as valências que existem, para estar à frente na ligação entre múltiplos setores e para promover o crescimento. E por isso o crescer, não só em valor, mas o crescer no interior do país é absolutamente fulcral para nós. E o que é que, nós, que é que se passou no ano 2022? Nós tivemos o setor do turismo a crescer em todo o território nacional, em todas as regiões, a ser uma alavanca do desenvolvimento das economias locais e captando as tendências que hoje existem nos mercados internacionais, nós vamos conseguir fazer ainda melhor. E essa é a segunda questão que eu queria mencionar aqui. A minha experiência nas empresas ao longo de muitos anos ensinou-me uma coisa muito clara, não há contos de fadas nos mercados internacionais. Tudo resulta de trabalho, consistência, pensar no futuro, tentar ver quais são as tendências que existem, anteciparmos a essas tendências. Estamos na linha da frente desse combate pelo crescimento do país. Chamo a atenção para que o ano de 2022 conseguiu pela primeira vez na história da economia portuguesa 
superar esse desígnio de termos um PIB de 210 mil milhões de euros. Nós temos que nos próximos anos chegar aos 250 mil milhões de euros e a seguir aos 300 mil milhões de euros. Os problemas do nosso país só se resolvem criando mais riqueza. E quem cria riqueza são as empresas, os empresários, os trabalhadores, transformando cada empresa numa comunidade que tem um desígnio sólido para o futuro e que se move para atingir esse objetivo. E, portanto, como não existem eh, contos de fadas nos mercados internacionais, o que hoje precisamos, e esta conferência foi desenhada para isso, é inspirar as nossas empresas, é ajudá-las ainda mais a crescer, é capacitá-las para atuar na multiplicidade dos mercados internacionais. E conseguir capacitar para a internacionalização é um desígnio absolutamente essencial, porque nós estamos a diversificar cada vez mais as nossas exportações e o turismo é um exemplo da excelência mas não vamos conseguir manter-nos na linha da frente, ser dos primeiros destinos turísticos do, do mundo, se não continuarmos a qualificar a nossa oferta comercial, se não continuarmos a qualificar os nossos modelos de negócio, se não continuarmos a apostar no conhecimento detalhado dos mercados internacionais, se não continuarmos a especializar-nos e, sobretudo, a escalar os negócios. Quando olho para o nosso tecido empresarial, mais de 99,9%, é representado por pequenas e microempresas. E com todo o respeito pelas pequenas e microempresas que temos que continuar a apoiar, nós precisamos de especializar e escalar, dar escala, porque só adquirindo escala é que conseguimos competir nos mercados internacionais. E é por isso que aproveito este momento para anunciar que amanhã a Portugal Ventures vai pôr uma nova call que se chama Call Turismo Mais Crescimento com uma dotação orçamental de cerca de 10 milhões de euros para dar mais capacidade e mais acesso a financiamento às empresas de turismo, sejam as que existem, sejam aquelas que venham a ser formadas. E queremos concentrar esta call em dois objetivos cruciais. Um é a capitalização das empresas, para promover o seu crescimento, promover a sua inovação, promover a sua expansão nos mercados internacionais. E o segundo é exatamente um objetivo ligado à agregação, à consolidação das empresas para adquirir em escala. Muitas vezes as pequenas empresas, quando se associam, quando partilham os serviços de back-office, a gestão financeira, as compras, o conjunto de atividades relacionadas com recursos humanos, elas podem diminuir custos, ganhar escala e competir nos mercados internacionais. E se nós conseguirmos construir estas redes colaborativas, nós vamos transcender os números que existem e afirmar-nos ainda mais como destinos turísticos do mundo e um destino turístico tem características que são muito próprias. Não é por acaso que os turistas nos procuram cada vez mais. Nós somos um dos países mais seguros do mundo, todos os rankings internacionais o demonstram e queremos sair de ser o país dos destinos turísticos sustentáveis. E este é o outro elemento que eu gostava de trazer aqui, para a reflexão ao longo do dia. Nós temos que ser capazes de ler o que, é que são as tendências, como é que o futuro se vai desenvolver e como é que o nosso grande setor do turismo se tem que adaptar a essas tendências, tem que reinventar os destinos turísticos tradicionais e tem que olhar de forma ainda mais sólida para o futuro. E o que vemos hoje nos mercados internacionais, na sequência da crise pandémica, é que a crise pandémica mudou a mente humana. Todos nós temos essas marcas do que aconteceu quando tivemos quase dois anos fechados em situações de confinamento. E, portanto, uma das grandes tendências que existe hoje no mundo é o escapismo. É as pessoas que querem fazer viagens, ter novas experiências culturais, ser submetida a novos destinos. E muitas vezes tem também associado a isto a tendência da nostalgia, de voltar aos lugares onde as pessoas foram felizes. E nós queremos transformar o nosso setor do turismo numa grande experiência não só física como digital, ampliando as redes de conectividade com as pessoas nos vários países do mundo, diversificando os mercados e apostando nessa diversificação. Aquilo que foi conseguido o ano passado no mercado dos Estados Unidos da América é absolutamente extraordinário, porque comparando com os números de 2019, o mercado americano cresceu cerca de 33%. 
E esta diversificação é essencial, ao mesmo tempo que crescemos nos mercados europeus. Portanto, este setor é um setor que pode construir mais riqueza, diversificar as suas atividades e integrar e incorporar no seu pensamento todas estas tendências. E uma das tendências fulcrais que hoje está no centro das preocupações daqueles que viajam pelo mundo é também a sustentabilidade. E é por isso que na altura da pandemia lançamos o selo Clean and Safe e as campanhas que o Turismo Portugal fez ao longo da situação pandémica, mantendo a conexão com os vários mercados no mundo, mas hoje queremos lançar o selo da sustentabilidade. Queremos que as experiências turísticas em Portugal estejam, tenham incorporado esse selo da sustentabilidade. As preocupações com o planeta são imensas. As novas gerações de viajantes têm isso no centro das suas preocupações. E é por isso que lançamos o programa Empresas 360, que já tem dezenas de empresas que, foram, que aderiram a esse programa, exatamente para transformar cada empresa do turismo numa empresa sustentável, na eficiência dos materiais, no uso da energia, na relação com o meio ambiente, na preocupação com a pegada carbónica, na minimização dos impactos ambientais. Se cada uma das empresas desenvolver este percurso, nós vamos ter cada vez mais turistas a visitarem o país, ligados ao paradigma da sustentabilidade. E se conseguirmos sedimentar esta imagem de um país seguro e sustentável, que vale a pena visitar, que está a diversificar a sua, a sua oferta turística, que oferece o turismo oceânico, como pode oferecer o turismo da natureza, como pode oferecer o turismo ligado à proteção da biodiversidade e dos ecossistemas, que é um turismo centrado no uso eficiente dos materiais e dos recursos, que tem estas preocupações ambientais absolutamente no centro de todo o desenvolvimento das suas atividades, nós vamos ser capazes de atrair cada vez mais pessoas e de uma forma consistente. E depois não podemos esquecer que o nosso país tem tudo para dar certo, desde a natureza, à história, à cultura. O turismo literário vai provavelmente sofrer um boom. O turismo gastronómico e, sobretudo, o enoturismo é absolutamente central e há nichos específicos do mercado para concatenar todas estas atividades, ligá-las e promover o seu desenvolvimento futuro. E essa é outra questão que nós vamos continuar a trabalhar com a nossa grande instituição, o Turismo de Portugal, que é promover o país nos mercados externos com base nestes valores que são absolutamente decisivos para o futuro. E queria recordar aqui, como escreveu o filósofo francês Henri Bergson, o futuro não é aquilo que nos vai acontecer, o futuro é aquilo que vamos fazer agora. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigada, Sr. Ministro António Costa Silva. Trouxe-nos aqui informação importante, nomeadamente a nova call, que é importante para todos os que estão aqui nesta sala, para todos os players do setor e que é notícia também que iremos certamente todos dar. Antes de avançarmos para a apresentação da próxima oradora, deixo aqui também uma mensagem relevante para toda a audiência. Uh, podem enviar as vossas questões para depois colocarmos a esta oradora que se segue e também às próximas. As questões vão ser tidas em conta, vão ser vistas, lidas, escolhidas e podem enviar através deste site que aqui aparece. <coughs> Tem aqui toda a informação através do hashtag Visit Portugal, através do Solido.com e depois no final da apresentação então eu terei acesso a essas questões e irei colocá-las à próxima oradora e aos seguintes que me irão acompanhar neste palco. E para já eu passo a apresentar-vos a oradora que aqui trará uma visão disruptiva, eu diria, por aquilo que li, por aquilo que sei, é a Mónica Bielasquita, é hoje uma referência do pensamento sobre o futuro, durante nove anos visitou mais de 90 países pesquisando sobre a interseção entre a tecnologia, as cidades e a cultura. E como é que todas elas, todas juntas, se perspectivam então no futuro? Não vamos falar só de robôs, vamos falar de pessoas, vamos falar de turismo, mas tudo isto uh, poderá ser um mix muito valioso para o crescimento do setor e para a sua diferenciação. A Mónica foi consultora de empresas como a Google, a BBC, também a Microsoft e ainda a Nike, entre muitas outras. Não vou aqui trazer o rol vasto e exaustivo uh, das marcas para onde já trabalhou. A sua intervenção é sobre o tema relevante do Designing the Future e eu vou convidar então a Mónica. Mónica, please join us in the stage to the next speech, and Monica is the futurist, the Protopia Futures. Monica, 
Welcome. <laughs> Bom dia a todos. That's the, as much as I can say in Portuguese. But I understand quite a lot. Um, it's such a pleasure to be all with all of you here today. I'll try to take you on a bit of a pensive and hopefully inspirational journey in the keynote part of my speech. But then in the question part, we can get down to much more practical details on how that applies to your industry. So we're going to be speaking about how we can design the future. Not just wait for the future to happen to us, but actually actively participate with whatever that we do in shaping the kind of future that we ourselves would like to inhabit. So let's start. Well, as I was introduced, I am a future studies person. Um, and a futurist, uh, that's how I share my insights, but most of the time what I do is really just try to understand what's happening and really bring together all of these insights. And so whenever people find out what I do, they always ask me, so what is the future for me? Um, no matter what industry they're in or whatever they do in life, they want to know what is that singular thing that is going to happen. Now what I can tell you, a kind of cheat sheet to know if somebody is selling snake oil, if somebody's a charlatan in my field, is if they stand up on a stage and tell, this is the only way how it's going to turn out to be. It means that they are set to benefit from that particular thing that they're pushing onto you. So the best that we can do as people in my field who try to understand what future could happen is to predict a sort of possibility space, a kind of a perimeter within which, based on our understanding and exposure. Certain things are most likely to happen, certain things are less likely to happen, and certain things are entirely impossible. Again, based on the current state of scientific research, technological innovation, social, cultural, and political kind of situation. And with any new breakthrough and with any new development, those things change. Now, how do they change? They change by our actions, but also by our inaction. So our apathy, whenever we think future happens somewhere else, by somebody else, becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So there's a real urgency for us to engage and really actively participate in bringing what we say that we want to see. Of course, our future visions are also shaped by how we saw the future in the past. And how did we see the future in the past? Very much top-down. So these visions that we have of the future past have been very much defined by people that have the least to lose, by the most privileged people within our society. And so, of course, they have centered the desires of theirs rather than the needs of the majority of this planet's population. And so that's something that we always have to take into account. Whenever something is presented to us, we have to ask, well, who is presenting that? And again, what is their interest within that? And how maybe, just maybe, a lot of most important voices that will live in that future have been overlooked in creating those visions. So I also want to tell a little bit of my own story. I was born in a country that doesn't exist anymore. It was called Soviet Union. My actual country was taken off the map through a secret Molotov-Ribbentrop pact between Nazi Germany and Soviet Union, between Hitler and Stalin. And so, what I realized growing up in that crucial moment when the wall that separated us from the rest of the wall, in fact, the kind of wall that enclosed us, that made it impossible for my grandparents and my parents to ever move past it, to ever travel and actually see the world, has fallen down. And so what I've witnessed is the opening of the physical world to me, but also of the digital world. And that's how I find my communities. And that's why the moment I got that treasured Schengen passport, I never took it for granted. As, of course, we can see with this war, we really should not take it for granted that these walls separating us, and not just 
not letting people enter, but actually not letting people exit places of their birth is something that is very real and we need to fight against. So, trying to be my ancestor's wildest dreams, since I got that passport, I ended up working, visiting, traveling, learning, and I think about 100 countries by now. And what that made me realize is that the greatest gift of travel is really to expand one's understanding beyond the perspectives that we are born into. So, currently, my home base is Johannesburg, South Africa. And there's a Nguni Bantu term that got popularized in the transition from apartheid to majority rule, Ubuntu. And that sort of, in grand term, means humanity. I am because we all are. Human because we participate, belong, and share. And so curiosity of each other and each other's cultures is what actually makes us alive. Travel should not just be about ticking off the boxes of the list and posting these images on Instagram. In fact, if we want to do that, a picture next to the Tour Eiffel, just put in your portrait and Tour Eiffel in mid-journey AI engine, and you can get a simulation of that. Almost as real as the real life. So what do actually people of my generation and younger want? Is something that I've wanted from the moment that I had this chance to step out of those walls that I was born into, is to actually get to know the place, to actually get to know the people, to actually experience it as fully as possible, right? And so that's something that makes your industry and that makes travel in general worth it, is to really go beyond one's own limitations. So, as I said, future ultimately must be shaped by those that will inhabit. Interesting point of data. In the UK, conservative politics and the Tory party is receiving more money from the dead people in their wills than from the living. I mean, how incredible is that, right? Not just generations that are soon to be gone, but in fact, the generation is gone already, making decisions for the ones that are not even born yet. Now, that has to change. Youth has to engage with what the world of the future looks like, because they are the main stakeholders. And when that doesn't happen, resentment breeds. And that kind of lack of agency, feeling that you are excluded, leads to weaponized discontent. And in the time of disinformation warfare, we know how wary we have to be of that, right? So we must find innovative ways for children and youth to be the real stakeholders in revitalizing what our cities and our countries look like. I remember this workshop I did in Sao Paulo, and there were two kids, one of them was 13 and the other one 14, and they really wanted to come to that workshop. It was about utilizing immersive media technology tools to create a project that they like to do. However, it was for the adults, so they couldn't join that workshop. They actually ended up convincing their parents. One of them was a, an executive of an advertising agency, and the other one was a neuroscientist, or neurosurgeon, I'm sorry, to join that workshop so that he could tag along. And of course, naturally, they were the best particip participants of everybody. What is the idea that they came up with, how to utilize that technology? They came up with the idea of AR filters to reimagine what disused public spaces in Rio de Janeiro could look like as reimagined by them and their peers. So you could go to a particular place that currently, well, nothing is happening, and you could put on the goggles or use your phone and see, well, what would the kids do with it? And then kids could submit the ideas how to revitalize that particular space. And then hopefully, the elders <laughs> would be inspired to actually say, come on, let's do it, right? So we have to do that. We have to create these intergenerational conversations. And these conversations, again, it between so many of us that currently that do not have the voice. So another huge thing, innovation should not lead to uniformization, 
monoculture doesn't serve anyone. There's a real issue right now, exported by, I'm sorry to insult, some of them have been my past clients, American consultancy firms that export the same blanket future solution everywhere in the world to the Mediterranean countries that are very different from suburban American reality, and even to global south. In a way, you could say a city like Dubai is more American than America because it was designed by these consultancy insights removed from the actual context where it was being built at. So there's also this fear that if we bring in more people from outside our culture or outside our gender group or um, outside our religion or something like that, right? Anybody who's sort of from the outside, that either then it will become some kind of chaotic reality or then everything is going to blend and everybody's going to be the same. Now, that is not the risk. In fact, if we invite people to really participate, to really contribute, rather than just integrate and be just like us, what it will result in is a kind of heterogeneous reality that will be vibrant, alive, and new, indeed, something that we didn't have before. So the kind of innovation that we should invite is innovation that comes from the perspective of not top-down, but top-up, right? And really challenge these kind of visions coming in from the people that have no stake in the reality that they're consulting on what it should be like. Okay, <laughs> those who control the fantasy control the future. I found that that's an absolute fact. We have this notion that it's the Elon Musks and the Jeff Bezos and the Sergey Brins, the tech gazillionaires of the world, that are most powerful people shaping the future. However, if you look into most of their biographies, what you find is that it's in fact a particular science fiction director or writer and a book, movie or TV series that they picked when they were kids, teenagers or young adults that actually made them obsessed with a particular idea of the future that they then set out to build technology towards. So fundamentally, it's not these techies that are defining what future is going to be, but it's people that are telling the stories of the future. It's future imagineers, the ones that craft the visuals and the ones that craft the narratives. And as I spoke about before, because of their incredibly limited cultural, gender, et cetera, et cetera, background. What we end up with is something like we see here when I typed in utopian city future visions. It's all this kind of grand idea of uniform architecture, skyscrapers shooting into the sky, no actually indigenous architecture, no integration of ancient architecture and new architecture. So in a case of city like Lisboa, how does that even apply, let alone any of the rural areas? So maybe we have to really look past these kind of ideas of the future that lead to its uniformization. And we also cannot allow people just from the outside world, Hollywood industry mostly, to define us what kind of thing is futuristic for us and really think, again, within our context, what is that we'd like to see in the cities that we inhabit. And really refuse this crisis of imagination of dystopia versus utopia binary. Because if we look really past the first layer of things, every single utopia has been built on somebody else's dystopia. So let's look into some issues with dystopia and utopia. Well, dystopia is this vision of doom that everything is lost, that environmental cause is gone. We're way too far into it. And so there's nothing that we should do about it. And so we just escape into consumerism and disengage from actually what is our role within it. And so regurgitation of these visions of doom, in fact, 
do not serve anymore to us as cautionary tales. They just become a kind of escapist fantasy and an excuse to not be part of it. So people say, well, maybe utopia is the answer. And there have been, indeed, a lot of historical utopias. From communist Soviet Union to Nazi Germany, these were all utopian attempts that only required, in many cases, genocide of the millions. And what's problematic with all of these historic utopian ideas, and even with some of these utopian top-down cities, is that they always were, again, defined by the most privileged, and generally, specifically chose to exclude the intersection of marginalization at indigeneity, queerness, and disability. Most of utopian visions deny the existence or try to magically cure disabled people, exclude queer identities, and absolutely disregard indigenous understanding of what our world could look like. So, maybe these are really not the patterns that we should follow. Maybe we need something new. And so I say, nostalgia is poison, but also no to techno-fetishism. Now, when I say nostalgia is poison, it's not about the fact that we should not be proud of our roots or love our history, but we should not just want to return to some kind of fictional idea of the past that we imagine was better, but rather learn, be inspired, be proud, but craft something new. But when we craft something new, we should not look into techno-fetishistic solutions that are really just like a plaster on a crack within a concrete on a highway after the earthquake. It won't actually fix that problem. In fact, technological innovation can never be some kind of magical panacea. If a problem is social, cultural, or political, the solution also has to be social, cultural, and political. Technology is just a tool, just an extension of our minds and our biology to help us in the process. It can never lead. We are the ones that have to lead that process. Technological innovation, in fact, without humanitarian evolution, always equals oppressive and exploitative future. And again, we should not be chasing those decontextualized, important models mindlessly. So, <laughs> I spoke a lot about what we should say no to, and that's important. I think Ted Industrial Complex sold us on this kind of idea that we should always just come up with an inspirational innovation, but never really address what is at the root of the problem but we actually have to understand what are we saying no to, what we don't actually want. But never stop there, because if we stop there, it creates a vacuum that then nefarious entities can fill in. So the moment we create that space with our no's, we have to say, what is our shared yes vision of the future? What we can together across generations, across different groups within society, enthusiastically say yes to. And for me, that's humanitarian evolution that leads technological innovation. They use technology just as a tool in the toolbox that has many tools. So, for quite a few years now, um, depending on how you count, from 10 to, <laughs> to 4, I've been working on a project called Protopia Futures. And we defined the kind of protopian principles that would help us to strive towards a hopeful, radically hopeful and inclusive idea of the future. And that can be within technological design, that can be within urban design, and that can be just within larger thinking of what the future could be. So here I'll share some of the insights of what kind of protopian principles we could adapt to the cities and the countries that we'd like to inhabit. So, these are inclusive hu of human plurality, centering the needs of communities, celebrating embodiment, movement, sensory experience, looking beyond sustainability, a regenerative approach to design, making space for spiritual needs of inhabitants and visitors, fostering creativity and emergence of cultures, and evolution of values, 
towards the principles of equanimity. Let me go a little bit into each of those. So, to be inclusive of human plurality is, means that instead of merely tolerating the difference, we embrace it for the wealth and resilience that it creates. Within computation, the more uniform a system is, the easier it is to hack. Similarly, within our society, the more uniform we become, the less likely we are to see solutions to more complex problems that require collaboration from multiplicity of perspectives. So, you know, instead of just tolerating each other, can we actually be curious of each other and want to understand what we have to offer from the different backgrounds and life experiences that we come? Here, many of you are from the tourism industry, where welcoming people is an art, to make people want it, to make people feel good, right? Not just, most of the travel ultimately is not about what I get to see, but how do I actually feel in a place? That's the memory that we actually carry down several years down the line when we forget the exact details of a place. What we remember is, did I actually feel good there? Right? So how some of your insights can actually serve society at large in welcoming these new perspectives, right? And not just, again, generationally, disability, gender, different queer identities of, but really in that broad space in between our identities, right? What are the most interesting things that we can find in there? One huge thing that I want to talk about, especially when it comes to our urban design, um, but also hospitality space design um, and, and, and airport design, as somebody that is on the autism spectrum and has ADHD, the needs of neurodivergent people are never, ever included. All right? So I have hyper sort of sensory sensitivity. I struggle with you know, all kinds of textures that, that might irritate my body, strong smells, too much sort of visual input. Now, when I arrive to the hotel, the scent is so strong, it gives me nausea, right? Most of the airports, it's so busy, full of scents, full of sounds, full of light, full of motion. And we could say, well, Neurodivergent people are quite few. Well, we're not that few that people think. And in fact, when we are really tired, <laughs> when we come from a long leg of a journey in the airport, most of us reach that stage of neurodivergence, where in fact we would love to have a space for sensory isolation, a calm place with a reclining bed, with a really quiet music, a place that is not over-scented and not overstimulating. And so many of us now, post-pandemic, have newly acquired disabilities and health conditions. A lot of us, when we have toddlers, or when we're pregnant, or when we have any temporarily disabling condition, find ourselves in that space where it would be so nice that our environment would be kinder and more compassionate towards our difference. So what I see here is to design towards human plurality and especially the most overlooked part of it, disability and neurodivergence, beyond just the access of the wheelchair and hard of hearing and hard of seeing, which of course is super, super important, is actually to make spaces better for most of us. When we're feeling just a little bit off, just a little tired, just a little weary, or we need to work on something that, that we didn't have the chance to do before we took on, to took on that journey, right? So that's one of the examples. Okay, the next one, centering the needs of communities. Most of our narratives, again, predominantly imported from North America, center individuals. But can we ever be happy alone? We need to refocus our narratives around centering communities. We cannot thrive and isolate ourselves and just be well if everybody else is unwell. Currently, in South Africa, we have really drastic load shedding schedule, where power gets cut up to 10 hours a day. And of course, the wealthiest people have managed to get um, the extra batteries and inverters and something that lets them cope with that. However, 
if the entire city is stuck in traffic because the traffic lights do not work, if people in the poor neighborhoods are getting robbed after the dark and impoverished through that, how can actually us in the nicest suburbs can be well? The same thing happened in the pandemic, right? When certain parts of the population got priority towards vaccination and certain parts didn't get access to it. And then we were surprised how new variants happened and how the disease could further spread. So this is all about rethinking what do we prioritize. In a lot of future conversations, people keep saying, again, predominantly in North America, that the future never came. Why don't we still have flying cars? Well, in fact, we kind of have flying cars in Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. But if we really think about it, would we like to live in a kind of city where the skyline is polluted with noise of flying cars and drones? And of course, that creates increasing hazards of terrorist attacks and accidents and just really having no peace even when you look above. So maybe that is the kind of retro future that we should really put aside and think how maybe much more futuristic thing would be to open our city skies for wild species of birds. And maybe rewilding our cities is a much more exciting thing than trying to pursue this lost dream of flying cars. And this is not to say, right, that we should abandon these technologies, because in fact, they can be useful. They can be useful for disaster relief, for ambulance, organ transplant. We saw what just happened in Turkey and Syria right now. We know that this could happen in Lisboa, right? So these new technologies, they can be incredibly useful. But again, if they center the needs of communities. So designing the world for the needs of the many rather than the wanton desires of the few. What we see right now with Elon Musk jet taking over, taking off to fly from San Francisco to San Jose. A 10 minute flight that could take him an hour to drive. And yet, he exudes all these carbon emissions. And of course, he would like that flying car. But is that something that is the futuristic thing? Or again, opening our skies for wild species of birds and fostering that relationship with other than human species is a much more interesting thing to do. Okay, the next point, celebrating embodiment, movement, and sensory experience. Most of these visions from sci-fi of the future, again, the most cliché idea is the image that I previously showed of a singular hero looking from a top, some kind of rooftop over a polluted city skyline with the only creative intervention being some kind of holographic ads. And of course, he, she, or they are alone, and they seem so removed from their very body. Is that what we want? I know that from a perspective of Global South, we really don't. We love to dance and play with each other's bodies and experience the world, right? So what kind of space for that we are making in the future cities and even in the future travel agendas? We know how much people love to travel to Rio Carnival or the Carnival in Trinidad Tobago and places like that. So instead of maybe thinking how we create these fancy technologies that again remove us more from ourselves and from each other, we need to think, well, what are the technologies that could be adapted for the joy of the embodied experience? Instead of allowing our governments to develop more exoskeleton body suits that could be used by police forces to contain the protesters. Maybe we could develop the kind of exoskeleton body suits that performers could be using in these carnivals for the joy and the wonder of the many, rather than for the benefit, again, of the few. Right? So, so many ideas within that to celebrate, and I think that's urgent, because military research should not be the only thing funding technological innovation. Okay, I spoke, this is the image illustrating what I spoke about with making space in the, our future city skylands for wild birds. And what I mean by that is that we need to move beyond sustainability. 
into regenerative approach towards design. So much damage has been done already, we in fact need to repair it. And the only way to repair it is not just by engineering and building, but also by growing, nurturing, and rewilding. And in that, we need to move from what entities like IDEO popularized through their design thinking, human-centric design, and us considering that to be a good thing. Of course, we're the center of every story that we tell as humans. But the more we understand about the research in biological sciences, medical sciences, and neuroscience, is that we, in fact, cannot be well if all of the other species are not well. Something like about 90% of DNA within our body is not even ours, but all of the microorganisms that live within us and on top of us, and you know, in our orifice and our hair and then within our guts. And they make a lot of choices for us, because if they are not well, we will not be not just physically well, but we might also not be psychologically or mentally well. Right? So we need to design for that multiplicity of species. When we imagine the most futuristic future buildings, we shouldn't think just how humans could live within, well within them. But does that create habitat for the other species? Right? Instead of more skyscrapers built out of steel and glass, can we imagine vegetal lattices overgrowing our building, buildings that not only help with earthquake resilience, but also allow for multiplicity of other species to thrive. I know that I have this amazing luxury in my house in Johannesburg every morning to wake up to the melody of the songbirds. And that's such a nice to wake up to. Could more of us that don't have that luxury to live outside of a city could wake up to that? And even as guests in different hospitality spaces, wouldn't it be lovely right, to engage with the other species. And in fact, data has shown that it helps us on a very basic physical health perspective, especially, of course, for the children and for the elderly. In a lot of the elderly homes where people, where patients were hospitalized with dementia and Alzheimer's, the moment they introduced songbirds, and that's not even any more sort of, let's say, complex animals like that they could bring in goats or cows or something like that for elderly to engage with. The symptoms of dementia and Alzheimer's got drastically reduced, right? So how, again, we could refocus our ideas on what is futuristic beyond just these fancy Zaha Didi looking like shapes to us bringing the rural and the wild within the urban and bridging that gap within the fabric. Now, there's a one very important caveat when we talk about future of green cities, which of course is a very exciting kind of subject and you know, most of the governments try to produce the visions of it, whatever. A lot of these ideas of walkable cities, cities where cars don't have any more access, can tend to lean towards eco-fascism. It's very nice for young, quote-unquote, healthy people that are able to walk you know, long distance or even short distances, it's a very exciting vision for them. But it becomes very difficult for somebody that needs wheelchair access or the elderly person or a pregnant mother with several young children. Right? So when we imagine these green visions of the future and when we think about the projects of rewilding and when we want to induce more walkability, we also have to think how disability Justice is factored into that, and how, while we do all of that, we still keep our cities and our buildings and our designs accessible. Next point, making space for spiritual needs of inhabitants and visitors. So many of the tourist destinations today are the cathedrals, the temples, and any other places of the spiritual gathering that still bring us awe and wonder. But why so few contemporary plans of architectures and urban designs ever imagine what new places for that could look like? Especially when less and less people are conventionally religious, yet we still have, as ever, spiritual needs. Right? So when we imagine the future of urban fabric, 
what kind of spaces for ritual and spirituality we could create. Because good design just doesn't just cater to our practical needs, but also fulfills our need for solace and belonging. Right? So something very important to think about. Because this is something that we love from our past, and yet we somehow keep overlooking in our future. As my dear friend Gabriela Gomez Mond, who was the founder of Laboratorio para la Ciudad in Mexico City, says, the right to the city includes the right to play. And this is not just for the wealthy suburbs and the kind of schools and, and public spaces where wealthy kids have access to something like that. And in fact, it's not just for the kids, it's for everybody. Human species is a creative species. We need to create, we need to play. If we don't make enough space for that, we create the kind of conditions in which fascism rises, right? So can we think how to replace these images of a futuristic city skyline with holographic ads by weaving in the creativity within the living city fabric to make space for creative practices, experiences, and play? How could we use, again, all of these fancy futuristic technologies not just to project more ads, but to make our cities into the kind of destinations. Not only that the visitors would like to see and Instagram themselves in, but even that the inhabitants would enjoy to walk out to and explore. And of course, these initiatives are starting to happen with things like La Nuit Blanche in Paris, where you know, all kinds of light sculptures are being created, but for one night only for that special festival and special occasion, how these things could become permanent aspects of our city life that take out people and make them want to explore. Okay, and the last point of Protopian visions for the future that we'd like to live in is ultimately evolution of values. This was during the protest um, in the time of the COVID pandemic. No volveremos a la normalidad porque la normalidad era el problema. We can't go back to normality because that normality was the problem. So as we start talking about the post-pandemic world, which is still not here, a lot of people still are getting sick every day. And now there's talks of the bird flu, the new pandemic, that seems to be just a question of time when it will happen. We should not attempt to go back to the same. We should think, how do we move and refuse extractivism, the kind of, again, predominantly American model that maximizes profit for the short term and not only clouds long-term vision, but in fact leaves utter devastation behind. We can't let this short-term desire leave us with a kind of situation where our very life and our very culture is taken away for consumers' purposes, and then there's nothing left out of it, right? So can we design for real exchange, for real equity, where visitors as well as inhabitants are able to contribute, not just take, right? It's important because we know that this crisis is coming and we should not just try to go back to something that in fact never was as amazing, even if profitable, but actually use this crisis as an opportunity to imagine something different. And in that, again, defying escapist fantasies is vital. There is no planet B. There is not just another place to continue going and devastating. And most of us here in this room care about this city, this country, this architecture, this culture. So how can we think for that long-term vision? Because, again, very American notion of disruptive innovation, move fast and break things, and that kind of attitude results in copious amounts of collateral damage. We are so interdependent and interconnected that it's delusional to think that we can build some kind of walls from other people's problems. We have to see how together we collaborate and learn from each other's strategies to ensure that this is the planet 
And this is the country and this is the city that continues to thrive. And in that, coming to an end, I want to say, give people everything they hope for, but nothing what they expect. We need that element of surprise and awe and wonder. Because if we just deliver what people thought they will get, it won't create a memorable experience, neither for the visitors nor for the inhabitants. So maybe instead of these giant flashy single projects today, we need to focus on radically hopeful and expansive vision that leads to a broader grassroots engagement to make our cities, but also the abandoned countrysides come alive with creativity, play, imagination, and innovation that actually serves our needs, regenerating not just our environment, but also our very understanding of what we think is possible if we actually come together to work towards a shared goal. It is up on us to define the future we'd actually like to live in. I want to ask all of you, what is that you can do with what you do to shape that future that you'd like to live in? And I'll finish with the quote by Bell Hooks, one of my favorite authors. To be truly visionary, we have to root our imagination, our concrete reality, while simultaneously imagining possibilities beyond that reality. Right? So we can't look away from our problems. We need to identify what do we say no to. But then we have to say yes to something beyond what is immediately possible. And then together, dream and work towards it. Thank you so much. Monica, thank you so much for inspiring us with this presentation. Uh, and uh, the audience sent us a lot of questions, so we don't have much time to, to put all the questions, but we'll start uh, with uh, some of these questions from the audience. Let me see some of these questions. Well, the first one, oops, just a second, please. Technology, what's happened? Okay, the first one from the audience. Um, the travel uh, world is dominated by big corps, big hotels, chains, big travel ag agencies. How can we be a force uh, against this uniformization? And you talk about that, the uniformization. Should we act uh, in the supply or the demand? What can a country or destination do against it? It's uh, three questions, three questions in one. <laughs> if you can uh, explain how can we uh, act, please. Well, I think there's actually a natural movement um, past that amidst the younger generation. Um, so I see a lot of you know, so-called baby boomer generation that wanted these more uniform experiences. And when they go even on the whole other side of the world, they still want to have French fries and hamburger. I mean, generalization, right? But basically, a lot of young people with the raising, when the rising awareness of climate impact of travel are becoming much more conscious of their impact. And so there's this idea that if I am to have that impact, I have to really make it worth it. And to make it worth it, it's not, it's not gonna happen through some kind of giant chain, and it's not gonna happen through some kind of uniformized experience. It has to happen by coming, visiting, entering a place, and really getting to experience it, and really get to enter in a community with the locals, right? So I think there's that natural tendency towards that. Um, now, another way uh, how we can't wait just for that to happen with the shift of the generations, um, it's really to try and reach people where they're at. So utilizing digital tools to reach our potential audiences and our potential clients with the kind of experience that only us as again, more smaller companies, companies offering more unique experiences can provide. And so I think I didn't manage to touch, uh, I spoke a lot about sort of technological fetishism and stuff like that, but one of the most kind of fetishized technologies um, and sort of hypes up technologies, um, oftentimes very ignorantly so, over the last few years has been the metaverse. 
right? So all of these cities are kind of starting their own metaverse and stuff like that. Um, and how can the metaverse help uh, tourism, for instance? Exactly. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm coming to it, right? Um, and, and oftentimes, these are just hyped up projects by cities have too much money to burn. However, if we look at immersive media, media technology as a way not to replace the travel experience or not to create some kind of flashy but ultimately purposeless uh, type of project, but as a way for people to be able to choose better what kind of experience they ultimately would like to have when they actually get to travel. So a way to prepare and make better choices before you go on to that journey. Or, as well, after you have traveled, to continue learning about it or to see a whole additional layer of the experience that you have had and kind of understand broader either historical context or even a future vision of a particular city context, right? So utilizing technologies and especially, you know, virtual reality, immersive uh, media technology, augmented reality, uh, not some kind of replacement of the physical travel, but as a way to make better choices for their travel, as a way to gain additional layers to it. And now, again, coming to that, if instead of those technologies only being utilized by large corporate entities, there could be more of a community collaboration between smaller businesses that offer something more unique and that they could use something that receives a lot of media attention to, to promote what is their vision and then reach these audiences where they're actually at, I think that could be something really quite interesting. Excellent. I hope the answer uh, will be satisfactory. Uh, espero que a, que a resposta tenha sido satisfatória para aquela que era a dúvida. Eram três perguntas numa. I'm so sorry to talk in Portuguese now. Uh, but I think it will be uh, uh, very useful to our audience. The other question is, how can we give more to those who visit us? It's not just accepting or welcoming. Uh, so what more can we give? In Portugal, of course, <laughs> if you can say. Um, well, what more can we give? I think, again, we have to, uh, if we want to understand what we can give to people, we have to understand what, what they want. In order to understand what they want, we actually have to ask people, right? And especially we have to ask people that maybe we haven't been asking before. So listen before acting. 100%, 100%. And again, I think... You know, one of the most overlooked aspects, I try to touch that upon in my talk, um, is all of the communities that, in fact, currently are alienated from traveling, right? So disabled people, queer people, neurodivergent people, who currently really would struggle to stay in the hotels as they are, to use the airports as they are, right? So to adapting to those needs of underserved communities. As well as, of course, there's a whole rising generation across Global South that is finally able to financially afford themselves to travel. And yet, most of the time, when they come to European countries, when they come to North America, they're not treated in a welcoming way. And even there's that perception that before they even come, that they will not be welcome. So they choose to not travel. I mean, I have so many friends in South Africa that are young people that are you know, artists, creatives, directors, you name it, that are very well off, very successful, and yet they haven't made the journey, um, especially to Europe, because the perception is that they will not be welcomed, people will not be curious about them, etc., etc., etc. So I think there's that. And then another huge thing is, again, invite people when they're young and build that relation when they're young. So a huge aspect is to advocate for broader, m more sort of, um, more inclusive, especially education, right? How to bring talent from around the world that gets to come here, maybe just for an exchange program, not maybe study the entire degree, but even for just a year or half a year, and ensure that they have a great experience so that when they go back to their countries, they become successful, they end up having children, and they end up telling all of their friends they could come back here and bring their community with them right, to visit and to explore and to enjoy these places. So again, I think it's really about, um, instead of just thinking how do we cater better, better to the ones that we've been catering to already, how can we find people that could be our potential audiences, 
but that we have not been reaching out to or have not been reaching out effectively because we do not bother to engage people that understand them. Meaning that you know, if you are directing a campaign towards different communities in a global south or different sort of underserved, neurodivergent, disabled communities, etc. Yet, you will not have anybody in your team from those communities. Then how are you able to campaign, to be inviting towards them if you don't even understand why they haven't been coming here in the first place? Right? So it's always about collaborating. So it's never, I say, what I always say is never designing for, it's always designing with. So if you want to welcome, somebody that hasn't been welcomed before, you need to ensure that you bring them onto your team so that they can reach out to their peers, colleagues, um, country men and country women. Monica, thank you so much. I have to choose two questions from the audience. The time is running and the time is off. Thank you so much for your presentation and your collaboration with the audience. Thank you. You can return to your uh, thank seat, you so please. Thank you so much. <laughs> applause for uh, Monica. Bom, ficaríamos todos mais uma hora a conversar com a Mónica, certamente, com muitas perguntas e muitas vão ficar aqui de fora do nosso guião, mas o tempo corre e queremos avançar para o próximo painel. E neste próximo painel, que se segue, antes disso, antes de vos apresentar o próximo painel, talvez só duas ou três mensagens a reter aqui da apresentação da Mónica, pelo menos aquelas que me chamaram mais a atenção foi precisamente criar um link intergeracional, fundamental, aliás a Mónica falou disso agora também, de ir captar os mais novos, ir muito cedo captar aquilo que é o nosso mercado, inovação sem uniformização, uma mensagem reforçada pela Mónica nas suas respostas e porque, diz ela, a monocultura não serve a ninguém, não se adapta a nenhum serviço, a nenhum cliente, mas é preciso também ter muito cuidado quer com o excesso de nostalgia, quer com aquilo a que chama o tecnofetichismo. Portanto, não nos deixemos também embarcar em tudo o que é tecnologia, esquecendo o human touch. Estas três, quatro mensagens, creio que vale a pena reter naquilo que é o delinear da estratégia para o setor do turismo dos próximos anos e dentro daquelas que são as vossas empresas naturalmente. Creio que neste momento já temos o palco quase pronto para seguirmos para a próxima conversa sobre Building a Proud Destination. Ora, nada melhor do que realmente criar um destino com, com orgulho e construí-lo cada vez melhor. Para isso vamos contar com dois oradores que me vão acompanhar neste palco. Billy Corber, que é cofundador da Hospital Me, uma voz ativa na indústria de viagens LGBTQ+, e foi o mentor da revista Out and About, a primeira da revista americana de viagens gay. Please join me on the stage. Também connosco vai estar o Diogo Silva, que já aqui está, já chegou. O Diogo que ajudou a fundar duas ONGs na área LGBT e assumiu a coordenação europeia do projeto norte-americano It's Get Better Project. É o presidente da Variações, Associação de Comércio e Turismo da LGBTI de Portugal e coordenador da campanha Proudly Portugal. Vou-lhe pedir para me acompanhar, que se sente também aqui deste lado e eu vou acompanhar-vos aqui nesta cadeira. Welcome to the stage, welcome to this debate, Billy. Thank you, um, You are an expert on this uh, kind of subject, so let's uh, learn more about this. Billy, I would like to start with uh, asking you about the profile of LGBTQ plus travelers. What do they look for in traveling? So I think there's a real misconception with LGBTQ plus people that they're looking for LGBTQ plus specific events. And really the thing that is most important to LGBTQ plus travelers is that we feel safe and that we feel comfortable to be ourselves in a destination. And they sound very simple things. And I think they're things that... And do that you feel safe and comfortable in Portugal now? Very much so. My okay. fourth trip to Portugal. <laughs> um, and I think one of the great assets that Portugal has as a tourism destination in reaching this market is that the perception of the destination from people who have traveled here, and not just to Lisbon, but around the whole country, is that they do feel very safe and welcome. A lot of destinations like to say that they're, well, it started by saying they were gay friendly, which was pretty easy back in the 90s, and then gay and lesbian friendly, and then LGBT, and now LGBTTQQIAA2SNBGNCPP+. Oh <laughs> uh, I know, it's a very long acronym, and I won't take the time to explain them all, but understand, keep it simple. Keep it simple. <laughs> understand that there are a lot of very different people who fall under this umbrella of uh, sexual and gender diversity. 
And I think the challenge is that when people think LGBTQ+, they think gay men. And that's a very valuable market for many, many reasons. And it's certainly the most established of those uh, communities and the one that is least marginalized. Uh, but people who are gender diverse face enormous uh, discrimination and uh, challenge, discomfort when they travel, even doing, trying to do something as simple as going to the bathroom. Um, so being welcoming and being a destination that feels safe and welcoming to the full spectrum of people um, really requires you to think about the full spectrum of people. I loved um, what we heard earlier this morning about neurodiverse people, um, gender diverse people. When you look at the kinds of people who are traveling and the, the broad range of disabilities, all of which are contained within the LGBTQ community, this goal of making your destination feel welcome to people who have historically not visited or who are not visible visiting by engaging them in the conversation and making sure that they are helping you create destinations and experiences that are welcoming is, is a really important thing, more so than the specific LGBTQ plus offerings that you might have in a city. Mm -hmm. And how to provide an inclusive and respectful welcome for this community. Um, how to do it uh, in practice. <laughs> uh, so that is really the core of our business at Hospitable Me. And we work with uh, destinations and brands in tourism and retail, uh, some destinations that are considered very queer popular. New York City, we spent three years working for New York. I always like to say, if New York needs help, everybody needs help. Um, we have two pieces of training, uh, which are available to you, actually, to attendees of this conference for free. Uh, we created the Booking.com Proud Hospitality Program, which is a program for hotels, any hotel that's on the Booking.com platform. I should say any accommodation. Doesn't even have to be a hotel, but any overnight accommodation on the booking platform can become proud certified. Um, and then we have a masterclass online called Everyone Welcome. It's about a two and a half hour uh, self timed uh, masterclass introduction into the market. Uh, it's normally about $500, but I have uh, anyone here today who gives me a card or contacts me on LinkedIn afterwards will send you a free enrollment. But give enrollment. us an example. What can you learn at the mother so, masterclass? We talk about a few things. The first is who we are. So lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer. Trans and queer alone really complicated, let alone the rest of that uh, mm -hmm. acronym. Uh, we talk about the ways that queer people have traditionally been excluded or disrespected or made to feel uncomfortable. Um, it's everything from making sure that same-sex uh, relationships are respected. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, we all talk about two men getting one bed, uh, but also that we are celebrated in the same way that any other honeymoon couple or wedding couple might be celebrated when we come to visit. For gender diverse people, having bathrooms that are not binary gendered, having a, a gender inclusive or gender neutral restroom available, super important, making sure that those uh, facilities are, are available and known uh, to that community. When you um, when you look at the LGBTQ market, we include LGBTQ families, typically are, are frequently not really respected as families. They're often asked, oh, where's mom if it's two men uh, with a kid or you know, giving her mom the day off? Uh, so a lot of those things really about just sort of understanding who we are. Um, and then in the training, we go through some of the ways that you can be more welcoming and inclusive. Some of them are really simple, uh, using pronouns. Uh, so in typically in English, harder in other languages, uh, but uh, English people who don't identify as male or female often use the pronoun they or a constellation of other pronouns. Uh, we encourage we encourage front consumer facing hospitality providers in uh, the industry to include their pronouns and email signatures or on their their name tags. Now, a lot of people will say, well, it's obvious that I'm a man. I present male. Why do I need to say that my pronouns are he, him? But when you include your pronouns in a signature, it sends a signal to the person receiving it that you at least understand that pronouns are a thing and that by sharing your own pronouns, you make that person realize that it's safe for them to do the same, that if they tell you, hey, my pronouns are, are he, they, which are mine, or they, them, or z, zim, there are a lot of them, they're in the master class, um, <laughs> that you won't go, what, or huh, but you, you'll understand what they are. Um, 
So I think that piece of education is really essential in order to make sure that tourism providers within the destination. I was having a conversation with my driver, Carlos, this morning. Drivers are the first and last people that you meet in a destination. And if your first interaction is with someone who doesn't understand or denies your identity, that sets the tone for your entire trip. So really, everyone throughout that experience has to understand who queer people are and how to make us feel more welcome. Excellent examples, Billy. Thank you. Diogo, would you like to share first uh, uh, a video with us? And after that, we start with the, the debate. Would you like yes, to? Yes, yes. If it's possible, okay. I would like to open Let's see the, the video. The video, yes. Essa é a dor de tantos que amam Daqueles que já nem fazem mais planos Lutando pra serem aceitos Lutando pra darem seus jeitos Colocam na cruz esses bravos soldados Que de tanto sofrer seguem acostumados Insistem mais tanto falha E mesmo com quase nada Se mostram por inteiro 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 Minha vida severa Mas com muita poesia Seguimos em plena harmonia Marco, um, let's talk about this The, the Euro Prize uh, 2025 Will be a big challenge And a yes. goal of course um, What's being planned? So let's Let's start from the beginning. I mean, when we created Variações in 2018, the purpose of our, of our organization is very simple. It's to show to Portugal and to the Portuguese market the opportunities that we're missing. And was, what, what, what Billing was saying is, is, is perfect and perfectly example of Portugal. Portugal is a very, especially Lisbon, is a very high appreciated destination for LGBT travelers. Although it didn't have any strategy or any team working specific to promote Lisbon as the LGBT destination. Just to be aware, the first time that on the tourism strategy promote Portugal as the LGBT destination was in a document was in 2017. So it's quite new mm -hmm. to Portugal to promote themselves as LGBT destination. That shows one thing, that Lisbon and Portugal is authentic, a very welcoming place to LGBT travelers. But at the same, at same times, this creates a quite interesting paradoxical situation because the LGBT community sometimes don't, in, that is based in Portugal, don't understand how the foreigners see uh, Portugal so welcoming because we don't see that opportunities happening. Mm -hmm. So, but do you agree with Billy uh, when Billy said uh, uh, Lisbon is comfortable and secure for the community of LGBT? Yes, it is, obviously. Uh, obviously, the local community struggles more because they are, it's different when you're traveling, you, are, you have a income with you, you have already everything planned. The locals are, are different, obviously. Um, but I think that one thing and another can actually come together and create synergy and opportunities. And Variações is the perfect example of that. Variações was born in a, in a, in a dinner between friends actually where, where Bill is staying at Late Birds, I was working there, mm -hmm. and was the proposal to, okay, let's bring our effort, the people that have business, that are entrepreneur, that are part of the community, that have hotels, restaurants, bars, uh, uh, nightclubs, 
that exist for more than some some of them for more than eight uh, for more than four decades in Lisbon. Let's bring out all together and give a voice to this community, and that and also this community give opportunities to LGBT people. So by doing this, what we what, what we understand is that the Portuguese market was. And once again, I think is also related with our cultural. Um, it's very interesting because, and, and don't take me wrong, because most of the things if I, that Bill said, if I was me saying it, will not, ha will not have the same impact as Bill in saying it. <laughs> because I'm Portuguese. And it doesn't matter the type of education that I have, we still have this idea that everything that is coming from abroad is better than it's coming from Portugal. And it's very interesting because if you compare with our, with our neighbors, Spain, they are quite the opposite in that sense. They are very proud about themselves sure. and they, they are very proud about their nationality and, and they, say, uh, they sell that. They have so, Ganesh. But, but, but <laughs> exactly, but I say in this, what Verisões is trying to say is to see the different opportunities that exist. Portugal, without doing anything, with actually having a lack of LGBT events and LGBT perspective and the, and the tourism companies don't communicate often to LGBT community, imagine if we do it. Imagine if we, we as a country, as, a, as institutions or as an entrepreneurs, start to have events or specific communication to LGBT community. That probably will open a lot of opportunities. And also, and I think it's very interesting to grab what we're saying before, is like, just don't simply communicate it. Just prove it. Because I'm, although I'm president, I, I was just elected last week, so mm -hmm. it's quite a surprise also for me, president of the board. Um, uh, but I, I'm one of the founders and I was ex mm -hmm. executive director, so I was very engaged and involved in the strategy of the organization. And it's interesting because communicating is quite easy. It's the first step, saying, okay, we are willing to be welcome to everybody and also to LGBT community, and we want to communicate to that community. But the first thing that I do when companies ask me consulting um, um, projects to, to their communication track is, who is, who is leading that communication? Who is communicating? Because if, not, if you, in your team you don't have people that are from... LGBT from the LGBT community or that are from more, uh, more diverse communities, how do you plan to communicate it? We will not be honest, we will not be authentic. And that, we, and that actually goes, the rents, goes against what por por Portugal is all about. It's all about being ourselves, being authentic, being true to our values. Be, I love this word in, in English, there is no translation to the Portuguese. Be unapologetic. And that's something very tough in mm -hmm. Portugal because of our very uh, Catholic cultural, very, very Christian cultural. And it's interesting. And by saying this, and, and, and I, I, have the, I have this default that I speak too much. But let me return to the question. Yes. It's being planned to the 2025 with the Euro Pride. What do you predict? What has been planned? So the Euro Pride 2025 was um, was a, uh, um, a bid that was was mostly uh, was mostly organized by Variações and Ilga Portugal with the support of Ampus and Red Execo. Why we have done it? Because Euro Pride is not only a tourism event; it's also an event about human rights, about pride, about activism. Um, I coming from the traditional activism, as, a, as I was presented, I already established three different NGOs in Portugal. Mm -hmm. And uh, I bring the It Gets Better project to Portugal. So I coming from the traditional activism, but then I also understood that I'm an entrepreneur and I need to create my own opportunities. And obviously I, I see an opportunity mm -hmm. in working in the LGBT markets. By saying this, the Euro Pride 2025 is an event that is going to be what we want in to be. I'm being very honest. We have an opportunity... Euro, Euro, Pride, Euro Pride, it was a success in other cities. Yes. What do you predict to Lisbon? It depends what we wanted to do. 
I mean, everybody in this here and in this room, everybody knows, everybody's talking about the, the youth encounter, Catholic youth encounter that's going to happen in August. I think it's amazing. I think it's very, very good. We have big events in Portugal. But Terror Pride could be even bigger if you plan it well and if you plan it in advance. Just give you an example. Our neighbor, Spain, they organize the biggest pride in Europe. It's always in Madrid. Regularly, the pride event in Madrid goes around 2 million, 2.5 million people every year. When they organize the World Pride, they already organized Euro Pride and World Pride, the last one was World Pride in 2017, they had 3.5 million people on the city. And so we are talking about hotels fully booked, uh, uh, accommodations fully booked, and people staying at friends' places. Obviously, we're not, we're not going to have these numbers in Lisbon because we don't have that capability. But we can have higher numbers than the youth encounter. And we are not saying people that will stay on the tents. It's people that stay in hotels that will pay accommodation. And Europride is based in several main events. One of them is the Human Rights Conference. And also, the conf we want to spend that and do a corporate uh, conference and also a youth conference. We also are talking about uh, we're going to have to have a, what, we, what we call a pride village, a place that where people can meet the project of the LGBT community, give empowerment, talk about human rights, and also about visibility. Tell companies and companies from different sectors, like tourism sector, high tech, um, any type of companies that wants to have social responsibility can engage with, with Europride. That's the main intention of the event. So Europride is a perfect example that human rights and private sector don't need to be disconnected. They're actually the opposite. Mm -hmm. When we talk about sustainability and in a world that we, we want to live in a world that wants to be sustainable, then we have to talk about social responsibility of the companies. And that's the main purpose of Europride. So Europride is going to be what we, as a country, as a city, as a public organizations and private organizations, wanted to be. From my side, I will, I will try to get everybody on board, mm -hmm. although I know how difficult that is. Okay. Billy, <laughs> are you so optimistic as Marco about the Europride? I'm actually much more optimistic. Much more. Uh, <laughs> Five worked, million. Is we worked, well, we worked on World Pride in New York City for three years, mm -hmm. bringing New York City to Madrid to promote it, and then... Um, activating in New York City. Uh, we had five million for World Pride yeah. in New York. It was quite a big event. Uh, but our goal was not to bring people to New York for World Pride, because our hotels are already full in June. And I would say to the audience today that if you look at World Pride as simply an opportunity to fill your hotels for one weekend um, of the summer in 2025, you're missing the big opportunity because World Pride is an opportunity, Euro Pride and World Pride, really all of the communal prides are an opportunity to do two things. One is to really engage your local community, as you said, with the LGBTQ community and really help the tourism industry and the LGBTQ community um, communicate and cooperate to deliver not just a great event, but an increased awareness of each other and the benefits of partnership. And the other, is to use the fact that, that Portugal and Lisbon are hosting Euro Pride to send a message to queer people around the world about the welcome of the city. And World Pride and Euro Pride are an opportunity to drive a million or two million visitors, not on one day in the summer, but all year round and for years to come. So that's really the opportunity. And the other thing, it's the European travelers who come to Europride or World Pride come just for the weekend. People who cross an ocean, so people who are coming from North America or South America for Europride, are an opportunity to spend a week or more in the country. And so from a specific marketing point of view, and particularly for those of you who are outside of Lisbon, Europride represents a, a big opportunity for you as well with the international market. So it will be a kind of window for a new market, I imagine. Um, let, uh, let's talk about uh, another topics. Uh, what uh, was missing in the LGBTQ plus marketing uh, that led to the creation of agencies and associations like Hospitable Me 
and variations. So at the beginning, you know, the International LGBTQ Travel Association, the IGLTA, is celebrating its 40th anniversary this year in Puerto Rico in October. And you mentioned there are some bars or establishments here in, in Lisbon that have been open for 40 years. 40 years is a long time in LGBTQ because back then we wouldn't be on a stage openly openly queer. It didn't happen. And so back then it was really about, are we welcome? Can we get check into your room as two men, check into your hotel as two men and get a room without being left out? Um, now I think what is missing is a is an understanding of the market tactically. So when we talk about you know, what's the relevancy of LGBTQ to tourism, what do you need to do to address it, and how do you bring more queer people in, um, those are complicated issues because they're different for every single business and every single destination. Everybody has unique opportunities and challenges. And I think agencies and organizations like ours can help put your challenges and opportunities into perspective of what typically works and what doesn't work in, in destinations of comparable size or comparable attraction. Um, and the other thing which Diego mentioned, which I think is really critical for all communities, and Monica mentioned it earlier, is that we have to be part of the conversation. It's not marketing. It's not creating something for us. It's creating something with us. And so agencies like ours, uh, associations like Diogo's are really a way for you to tap into the kind of intelligence. You know, a lot of organizations in the past decade or so would say, oh, we've got a gay guy who works in accounting. He's going to help us figure this out. Well, he may be gay, but he may not be an expert in LGBTQ tourism. And the other thing that is a challenge for us and all organizations is that, you know, I'm a, I'm a queer, you know, man, but I don't necessarily represent the entire thinking and perspective of our community. My team is extraordinarily diverse in terms of looking at the gender diversity. Young people in particular are very, are much more likely to define themselves as something other than straight um, or other than male or female, but less likely to put themselves into a box. So you have a bunch of people who are saying we're different. We're different than the mainstream. Um, and understanding sort of the full breadth of what that means to create something with them that is exciting and attracting. It's not just about attracting you know, rich, white, gay men. Marco, do you agree? What it, was missing? It's, it's Diogo, not Marco. Um, uh, Diogo, sorry. No, don't worry. Diogo. No, I totally agree. And that's the bit that we, we have done to this video and the bit that we presented in, in Turino, where, we, where Lisbon was elected with 80% of the votes. So there was, there was a, a, very, a very uniform idea that Lisbon should organize Euro Pride. We present our, an hour bid, and the video is about that, is about the diversity of the city. And highlight that and put that on stage. I mean, let's be honest. Variations is mainly made by white guy, uh, white male, cisgender, white white male uh, men. Uh, I'm the perfect example of that. Mm -hmm. Although I'm coming from the countryside, I'm, I'm I have my path, but I know about my privilege. So, and but variations also have uh, also are, are, is aware of it. So we want to highlight the diversity of the community, and also. The owners of the business, they understand that they represent much more than them. They represent the community. There is also a social responsibility from the LGBT business because they understand that before the organizations, before the parade, there was the safe space of the community. I mean, the oldest LGBT places in, 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 in Lisbon, I recommend to go there, is Finalmente Club. It's a very tiny place that is open every single day with drag queen shows, with Devra the Cristal, okay that she, she is responsible of, of the show. This is something historically that we as a community have and we need to highlight. But also the fact that Lisbon have a very multicultural queer community. And right now Lisbon is booming with transgender and black community doing their own and queer black community do, doing their own parties. And this is fantastic. We need to highlight that. We need to show the world that these places are welcoming and they are not ghettos. Sometimes people attack us and say, uh, or try to highlight, oh, this is creating ghettos. No, no, no. Ghettos is when actually people, are, they only can be on that space because they don't have opportunities around it. 
these places are places of opportunities because people, queer, peer, queer people, they are creating their own safe spaces and they are welcoming non-queer people and tell them, you are welcome to come. Mm -hmm. this, is a, this is about entrepreneurship. This is about creating opportunities. And I totally agree because sometimes this, that's something very often that I hope that I listen in Portugal is like, oh, we have a person that is gay or is lesbian. Yeah, okay, that's great. But they are not experts. And sometimes it doesn't matter if you are gay or lesbian. If most of the times it still happens, they are closet or they are inside, they don't know they, don't, they are not actually part of the community. And they don't need to be. Everybody is individual and, and they don't need to be. Maybe they still live in ghettos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe. Or maybe they are just trying to fit in a society that tells them they need to be like that to fit. Uh, and, is, is, and it's very interesting how the LGBT tourism have the capability to open minds. Mm -hmm. And actually how LGBT tourists that visit Portugal have this like, this sense of activism. I'm, although I'm coming from association and activism, I really believe that the true activists are the ones that are anonymous and do simple things in every, in every day and they change their own realities. That's the true activism, if you want to say. But just to be, just to be clear, I, I can give you a personal story. It happened... In a this, few minutes, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This happened to me and I was not expecting to that happens. It only shows the opportunities that we still have. This is not a criticism. This is just an highlight of what we still need to improve. Um, I traveled to Açores uh, like one month ago. And when I, arrived, I was with my partner, and when I arrived to the hotel, the person on the reception said, oh, sorry, uh, you made a reservation with a, double, with a, uh, a couple bed. And I'm like, yeah, we know. Why, why are you saying mm -hmm. sorry? <laughs> oh, I thought you, you wanted separate beds. No, why? <laughs> so this still happens. This is a very simple thing. There was no dramatic event against it. But, but it shows how the norm and the ideas of heteronormative is still on the mind. And sometimes it's a simple thing because tourism, tourism welcoming starts on the border. When someone that is transgender or their gender expression is different from the gender that is in the passport, are welcoming or not on the border of a country. This shows how welcoming we are as LGBT destination. To the end and for finish, uh, Billy, um, how can we attract more travelers uh, from this community to Portugal? So you certainly have a great opportunity in the next two years in the lead up to Euro Pride to figure out and answer that question. Uh, we always look at sort of three things. The first is, is that you have to connect with your local community and make sure that you're aware what the community is, is, is doing, what they're interested in doing, and look for ways that you can support each other mutually. The second is to make sure that you are ready for LGBTQ tourists. As I mentioned before, give me a card, free training, either through booking or through our master class. Uh, it's a great way to get started. There are other resources as well. I'm sure your organization does, does uh, programs for businesses that are looking to be more welcoming. Um, and then the third is really to, to send that message. It's, um, it's, of course, the message for Europride. We want you to come. Uh, but it's more about Europride says something about Portugal. It says that we are open and welcoming. And if you're doing the work to be welcoming and inclusive, letting people know that. You know, the, the LGBTQ community is a, is a relatively easy and cost-effective one to target for tourism marketing. Um, our travel influencers, um, on a ratio of how much it costs to use them to the actual influence they have over people's travel um, is a very, very good ratio. Our media publications, uh, particularly local targeted media, if you look at your, you know, if you look at your high density LGBTQ markets against uh, the tap destination cities and you look for LGBTQ publications in those places, you can put together an extraordinary media campaign for a very small amount of money. So it's a be welcoming, work with your community, and speak directly to the community or the communities. Again, LG, nobody is LGBTQIA2A2+. <laughs> we're gay, we're lesbian, we're queer, we're queer and transgender, many, many different communities. Billy, thank you so much for the advices.
Diogo, not Marco. Yeah. Diogo, <laughs> thank you so much for the advice too Pleasure. and for inspiring us to the future. Muito obrigada a todos. Foi um gosto ter aqui este debate com o Diogo e com o Billy. Um, voltamos dentro de um momento. Vamos fazer uma pausa para um café. Até já. Have you ever combined textures, smells, and emotions? It's about connections and that endless joy. If we look at things with our own eyes, wine pairs with discovery. Wine pairs with Portugal. Ora, já é muito boa tarde. Boa tarde a todos. Bem-vindos aos que se juntaram a nós nesta segunda parte da conferência. Visit Portugal é a primeira edição e tem estado uh, repleta. Esta sala mantém-se cheíssima, o que é um gosto de ver. É sinal de que o tema é interessante e que merece a vossa atenção neste dia tão especial dedicado ao turismo e também a novos mercados, como aqueles que debatemos há pouco, como LGBT, por exemplo. Vamos voltar então aos nossos trabalhos. Temos um próximo keynote speaker que promete, a expectativa é alta para ouvir o Chris. Chris Twinning é Global Innovation and Media Director da de Dentsu e vai nos falar de tendências. É disso, aliás, que temos estado a falar toda a manhã. O Chris vai trazer aqui mais uma pitada de tendências para enriquecer o nosso conhecimento para a área do turismo. O Chris é um especialista em publicidade e em marketing e trabalhou entre outros grupos no grupo Louis Vuitton, na Burberry, aliás, foi a primeira marca de luxo a fazer streaming do seu desfile no Twitch. E uh, o Cris vai juntar-se então a nós, vai trazer-nos aqui muita informação, informação nova, esperamos. Vamos convidar o Cris para se juntar a nós neste palco. Estou a tentar situar o Cris, que já está aqui deste lado, exatamente, achei que estava deste, aqui deste lado. Cris, please, the stage is all yours. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very, very much for having me today. I think I was just introduced. I didn't understand a lot of that. I heard a couple of brands in there. Um, so yeah, just a bit of background on myself. I am based in London, born and bred. Um, and in my job, in my day today, I lead all innovation and special projects for the likes of Gucci, Bottega Veneta, Saint Laurent, so very much in the luxury space. Um, and previously, I've worked with the likes of Burberry, LVMH, and Dell as well. Um, and the reason I'm here today really is just to talk about kind of what innovations are emerging in the tech space that kind of intercept that travel but media space as well and how you can lean into those technologies and utilize them for your business. But just setting the scene a little and I'm sure you'll know quite a bit of this information already but for myself not being in kind of the day to day of the travel and tourism industry I think it's just important obviously to set the scene particularly as it pertains to EMEA and where we kind of are at this current moment in time. So. Last year, we had 900 million people traveling globally. In terms of levels we're at, we're kind of at 63% of those pre-pandemic levels. Europe is actually way out ahead of the other kind of regions. So they're actually nearly 80% of where they were pre-pandemic, which is great news for us, obviously. And there's so much to see and do in Europe as well for those kind of different people coming over from the States or coming over from APAC. So that's really good news in terms of setting that scene. But we are down 21% since pre-pandemic. So, Setting that scene, how do we utilize technology and innovation to kind of get back to that level that we were at pre-pandemic and making sure that we're actually trying to surpass that level? I found it really interesting that the World Tourism Organization actually are kind of really leaning into innovation. Um, and they've kind of called out specifically wanting to kind of look at digital transformation and innovation to drive their business. And I think with that, I, I, there's so many different emerging technologies that are coming to the forefront and obviously the COVID pandemic was was obviously negative on economies and kind of world travel but it also kind of pushed as ever where something bad happens something positive may come of it and in this case a lot of technological innovation was happening during that time and with that I kind of want to lean into free spaces with you today just to kind of give you an idea and an understanding as to how we can use technology to drive forward the tourism industry. So first and foremost we have immersive experiences so utilizing augmented and virtual realities to give people the ability to showcase spaces and places. 
Next, we have Travel 3.0. Uh, so how this Web3 and this new space and this new kind of immersive web is kind of leading the way and allowing people to actually experience tourism travel in a new way. And then lastly, kind of very much of the zeitgeist and of the moment, I'm sure everyone here has heard a lot about, about generative AI. Um, and we're seeing on LinkedIn every day new kind of user cases being kind of played out in real time. So I will just talk to that a little bit and understand, of, uh, help you to understand, sorry, how that can be utilized for the travel and tourism industry. So first and foremost, immersive experiences. So obviously, with the pandemic, everyone was in lockdown, no one could travel. And with that, there was a lot of kind of innovation around creating that escapism for people. And this example here on screen is called Window Swap. What Window Swap is, is basically a website where they crowdsource videos of people where they are sitting at their window. So anyone here could send Window Swap a 10 minute video of their setting, wherever they are. And on a shuffle play like this, you will see windows into the world. It's a really, really nice tool. And it created that escapism during a time where people really needed it. And with that as well, we saw obviously big tech actually playing into this space of escapism a little more. So the creator economy was already booming before the pandemic. And during the pandemic, a lot of travel uh, creators and um, key, key opinion leaders even were trying to do a lot around giving people that escapism that they needed during that time. And what Amazon and, and what Airbnb did is they lent into that and with their kind of trusted network of creators and influencers, they was able to productize that. So with Amazon, they launched a product called Amazon Explore, which allowed you to kind of lean into local cultures and experience. So if you wanted to go and visit Tokyo for the day, you could do so through Amazon Explore for a small menial cost of a subscription service. Alternatively, Airbnb, which was a service that allowed you obviously to go and book those different travel destinations, you could actually go and actually live with the, with the person that was kind of hosting that property through a virtual experience. They could give you the tour of the local area. They could give you the tour of the actual property. Obviously, you couldn't go to the property. And that has continued into kind of where we are today as well. So Airbnb actually utilizes service and, service and anyone can go and uh, experience local towns, cities, and even kind of places that they want to book. In the next video, I'll just show you an example of Amazon Explore and what that looked like when that was launched. Introducing Amazon Explorer, a new service that takes you across the globe in an instant. Welcome to Tokyo. Hey, Riku. Nice to meet you. My name is Libby. I'm going to be your host today. So I'm looking for a new scarf. We can visit a temple, check out the neighborhood, or go shopping. Let's start with the temple. How about something like this? This is exactly my style. Let's get that one. Amazon Explore. The world is at your fingertips. So that, they haven't actually continued that service post-pandemic. They've actually parked it because obviously the focus on other parts of their business. But I think it's a really good insight and a really kind of key innovation to see how the world was opened up at a time when doors were closed physically. And with that as well, there's other innovations that came out of that space. So AR and VR obviously are technologies that have been around for about 10 years now. But the kind of the way in which the technolo technology is advancing kind of on a day to day basis, even at this point, we're seeing the fidelity of those experiences become really lifelike. And if anyone has children here, I'm sure they've asked you at some point if they can buy an Oculus or buy a PlayStation headset. And even last Christmas, there was about 10 million kind of downloads of the app for Oculus. So Meta's headwear. Everyone kind of thinks about VR as this scary technology that kind of it doesn't aesthetically look great from someone looking at someone with the headset on. But if you actually think about the experience that there is in terms of the full immersion, the younger audiences, particularly those Gen Z audiences, they really are experiencing things through that technology different to how even we would experience them, say, 10 years ago. And again, on the next slide, I have another video just around an Oculus experience called Wonder, which allows people to go and explore those kind of local towns, cities, and uh, holiday destinations. Hmm, I wonder if the Great Pyramids are really all that great. I wonder if we can take Grandma to her childhood home. I wonder how many penguins live in Antarctica. I wonder what that bookstore on Polk Street used to be. I wonder. I wonder. I wonder. I wonder where to go next. Wow, you have to see this. Follow me.
So as you can see, the technology is there, it's just now about adoption. And as these younger audiences start to adopt these different technologies, and they really start to kind of lean into them more and more, you'll see more experiences like that emerge. But where we are currently, and if we think about the kind of marketing and media side of this industry, big players in the game like Snapchat, for example, are creating these escapism moments through their daily AR filters. So 200 million people globally use Snapchat for augmented reality on a day-to-day -day basis. So a lot of brands are leaning into that space, particularly with luxury brands that I work with. They do a lot in this space. But you're starting to see holiday brands and travel brands and, uh, and, and flight brands start to lean into this a little more. So just some of the examples on the screen here, and I'll play all of them at the same time. You have the likes of the Saudi Arabia tourism board, you have the Qataris, and you also have the likes of Lufthansa creating these portals into, into the real world through technology. I love this New York one here, so you literally walk out onto the terrace of, of the Empire State and you can experience the world around you. And as you can see, the fidelity of it is incredible. We're not talking anymore about it being like a video game that 10, 15 years ago did kind of look like a video game. Now it looks very real and you're, you're seeing these experiences become so accessible for the younger generation and those that are using Snapchat on a daily basis. And then we move into the gamification of tourism and travel. So I really, really like this example here from Moxie, um, who's obviously a subsidiary of the Marriott Group. So what they did with one of their, their holiday, uh, one of their hotels even in Asia was they essentially created a gamified experience in the market which basically allowed younger audiences to go and explore the different spots around the hotel. And with that, you could create your avatar, create your identity that allowed you to kind of stay with you during that visit. I'm sure, again, everyone that has children here, we're so used to it with children where they just go and they kind of spend their time in the kids' club. Now it's about actually allowing them to explore and engage with technology, allowing them to go around different parts of the hotel and actually beyond with obviously supervision. And again, I just have another video here around how that would come to life. So obviously it's an emerging technology again, but if we think about that, a lot of trends for these types of things happen in APAC, particularly China first. So you could see that adoption really happening across the globe. And then a really, really great example of how gaming as a technology is allowing younger audiences to experience new places and spaces. This is a, an example of a synthetic reality. So what the designer here did was basically take a real place and take a gaming engine to merge them together to create this synthetic reality. So if you actually look there, that isn't real. That's all been created in a gaming engine. So again, if we think about the fidelity of places that now people can experience through gaming, people are able to explore these expansive worlds. And this, for me, is an incredible technology. If we think about the two partners on the screen there, Unity and Unreal, 95% of all games are now built using this technology. So it, there's not really stopping anyone who's a creator in the gaming space from creating these types of experiences and allowing these younger audience to go and actually explore these places before they actually go there. We've really moved beyond Google Maps and kind of dropping people into a street view. And actually now, we're in a world where people can actually see right, with close detail what these types of places are about and what's going on. And then we move into Travel 3.0. So again, obviously, the last couple of years, um, all we heard about when it came to digital innovation and technology was NFTs, Web3. How could that technology incorporate itself into all these different practices and all these different industries? But kind of taking a step back, what is Web3? So it's this enhanced and upgraded web that really is kind of underpinned by this concept of interoperability. What do I mean by interoperability? At the minute, everyone here has an identity, whether it be on Facebook, whether it be on Instagram, whether it be on TikTok, whether it be on YouTube. We all have different things and different identities that make us those people on those platforms. The person I am on Twitter is very different from the person I am on Instagram. It's a different experience, and I want a different version of myself to be seen on those platforms. 
But if we think about what that interoperability piece is, it's about having that single source of identity or self-sovereign identity that allows me to be kind of in all of those different places and different experiences as me, rather than kind of being able to just be siloed and bucketed into kind of different spaces. And with that kind of technology that sits under that, this whole concept of blockchain being a very transparent and open protocol is a real thing. A lot of people don't necessarily think about the kind of the application of this technology. They, they think about the money making and the rug pulls that happened over the last couple of years, all of the negative press around this technology. But in terms of experiences and particularly digital experiences, this technology is happening and it's happening in real time. But what does it, why does it matter to the travel and tourism industry? I think there's three things really that we can think about here. First and foremost, obviously, there's the identity piece, having that self-sovereign identity. Then we need to think about reward. How do we engage and how do we reward people for traveling and going to specific destinations? And then lastly, unlocking those kind of bespoke experiences for people when they are utilizing this technology. This is a, just a simple kind of uh, visual to think about the difference in the different types of webs that have been and gone. So if we think when the, the internet came about in the late 90s, it was very much kind of like that single login. So you have your username and your password, and you have that for, say, your email. And then we get into this world of, as I've spoken about, all the different platforms. So we have all these different identities popping up, and all big tech kind of harvesting that data about us and what we're doing in those platforms to serve us a very bespoke advertisement so that we can then go on to obviously either book a, book a holiday or book an experience. And that's all based on our search data, based on what we're engaging, what we're liking, what we're viewing, all those different, all those different touch points. But as we get into that web free world, again, it's about that self-sovereign identity. And there's new players in this technology that are emerging for us to be able to kind of have that single source of data. And I'll go into an example of that on the next slide. But in terms of what are the limitations around where we are currently with all the different social platforms, Cookie deprecation is a real problem that we have in the advertising and media industry. I'm sure everyone here who's kind of in that space of, of kind of media and marketing know around cookie deprecation that if we lose all the signals of people as they go around the web, we lose the visibility to target people based on their preferences, based on their interests. And therefore, if we're trying to get to a specific audience to serve them a message around, we want you to come to Lisbon to experience X, we can't do that in the targeted way we've been used to for the last 20 years years. So as that technology deprecates, this new web free technology emerges as a kind of way to identify users. Um, and as I mentioned, on the next slide, if we think about the new types of platforms that are emerging in this space, one such example is Brave Browser. So Brave Browser is a search engine that operates on a cookie-less mechanic. So they don't use cookies, and they don't particularly serve a lot of advertisements. So any kind of page you go on there, say you go on a TripAdvisor, I'm sure everyone knows that experience. You, you go onto the page, you get about eight ads for different kind of places that they want you to visit. What this, webs, uh, what this browser does is basically eliminates all that and actually rewards people for engaging with advertisements. So they only serve out a very kind of few amount of adverts a day. And as you engage with those adverts or click on them, you actually earn a token. So with that token, as you build them up and you start to build the tokens within the browser, you can actually turn that into fiat currency. You can turn that into money. So you're actually rewarded now for your attention with advertising. And Brave Browser is at the forefront of that. And this isn't just an emerging space. They already have 60 million uh, daily active users, monthly active users, sorry. So as you can see, 60 million people are using this browser to be rewarded for their time and be rewarded for their attention. And if we think about a provocation there for the travel and tourism industry, there's nothing stopping a travel brand doing a tie-up with a Brave browser for their adverts so that as people engage with those ads, they unlock exclusive access to an event or an experience for the place that they are traveling to. All of those conversations are happening with the likes of Brave Browser and brands so that we can create those more bespoke experiences through advertising. And rather than it just being driving to clicks to a website all the time, it's about unlocking something that's a bit more memorable and a bit more tangible for people. But it doesn't just stop there with web free technology. There's also other emerging technologies in this space. So POAP, or Proof of Attendance Protocol, is another type of token that's emerged uh, over the last couple of years. And what this is, this is basically if people go to a specific place or go to an experience, they unlock a token which is stored in their crypto wallet. And what that allows for is for brands to then use that token to re-engage people as, as a form of CRM. We all kind of use email newsletters and we kind of keep in contact with our consumers and our customers through those types of technologies. This is the next kind of shift of that. So 
If I came to an experience here, say, and there was a PO app to unlock, I could add it to my wallet on my digital wallet, and then whoever was the proprietor of that token could then re-engage people based on the types of experiences they want to see and hear of. So think of a PO app as a new type of experience where I go to a place, I can then re-engage my customer with that technology. And then the other one we have here is move or travel to earn. So there's organizations such as Sweatcoin who started as a... Um, as a form of token, basically, where the more steps you do each day, you unlock new rewards and new tokens, which could then be redeemed, basically, against brands or experiences for money off. What you're starting to see now is they're working with organizations that allow people who are traveling about to actually earn a specific localized rewards. So again, if people have this app, which I recommend everyone do, because everyone obviously walks around on a day-to-day -day basis, you can track your steps through this, and you can actually be rewarded for moving about, basically. It's a really interesting concept. And then just with the sandbox, a super, super quick video, and I'll talk it through as it's playing, if I can. Yeah, so um, what the sandbox is, is obviously a web free well built on the blockchain. Um, as of October last year, they had around 20 to 30,000 daily active users in this space. And everything in this world is purchasable uh, through NFT technology. So think of what the Sims used to be, but actually being able to buy and apply everything from a kind of web free blockchain initiative where I can say own a house in that space and then I can sell it on a secondary marketplace. So it, beca it creates this marketplace for everything within the game. Um, the popularity of these worlds has dipped ever so slightly into 2023, but my point here is that younger audiences are using these spaces to kind of explore new destinations and go into these worlds and explore local delicacy, local uh, experiences, etc. And the example here you see is an example from Tourism X, where they actually created an experience in the game where they kind of lent into different cultures and different cities and different countries. Uh, and created that world so that people could go in and actually experience those worlds in the game. And what that allowed for is when they were in the game, they could actually learn about those cultures before they travel to a place or unlock experiences that they could redeem in the physical world. So creating almost a storefront in a digital gamified experience, but powered by that web free piece. Lastly, AI powered travel is the third pillar. So this is the one that obviously excites most people at the minute the most. Um, again, I'm sure everyone's seen different types of um, AI-based experiences and, thing, and people building with AI uh, through LinkedIn and different social networks. So the, the, kind of, the tipping point for this technology was um, a, a research, an AI research institute started by Elon Musk um, and another co-founder about five years ago. Elon Musk then stepped away from the organization because he obviously was preoccupied with other things. But Sam Altman, who was the other co-founder, is still very much the CEO of this. And recently, they've sold um, the company to Microsoft for 10 billion. So what's happening now is you're seeing these kind of AI-powered technologies be infused with the technology we're used to, like search, for example. And this has prompted the likes of Google, who have been in the AI space for a while, to actually start to productize um, their AI solutions. So over the last month, they announced a solution called Bard, which will be a kind of competitor to what Microsoft are doing uh, in the AI space. If we think about the kind of typical travel goer and what someone's doing in that travel space and how they go about their journey, everything starts with a search, right? So everyone here, whenever we go traveling, we'll always go to Google and go, I want to go and visit that place, what should I do? And this is just an example of that. So if we search on Google, I want to kind of spend a day in Lisbon, what is there to do? If we scroll down, we see a lot, of, a lot of different places to click, a lot of different websites that have got a recommendation on this. And we also see a lot of ads. Um, every, every time now you make a search, the first three to four places on a Google ranking are ads. So every time you click on them, the advertiser has to pay for your click. And if you're not aware of that, it's very native, it looks very native, and it's done on purpose, obviously, to look native so that we do click. But you can't necessarily always buy into the truth with adverts because, again, it's an advert. So we're very wise as to why that's there. But if we think about this application of AI, and we use the example I have here with ChatGPT, what we see is we see a new type of search emerging. And what we see here is these kind of AI-based models and machine learning models actually recommending what we should do based on fact rather than based on an advertising model. So again, the experience you see here is I asked the same question to ChatGPT what should I do for my day in Lisbon? And it started to give me all the recommendations of what I should do there. Now, this is an incredible, incredibly scary moment, I think, for us, and particularly if we think about the marketing space, because how do we intercept this? 
At the moment, there isn't a straight answer on how we intercept this, but what we need to start thinking about is embracing this technology. We shouldn't be scared or shy away from this technology. We should think that it is the future of these types of experiences around search, and therefore we need to really start to adopt them and think about how we embed them into our business practice. I mean, I might be out of a job in two years because of this technology, but right now I'm looking at how I can work with it rather than against it. Um, and another great example, where I started with this presentation, I went straight to this technology to ask it, what is the future of tourism in Portugal? And it gave me some really kind of <laughs> great answers around where I should be leaning into, so kind of thinking about sustainability and thinking about innovation. So again, don't shy away from this, play with it, engage with it. I think the one thing with this AI technology is that it's been kind of blown up and everyone is using it, and right now it's almost kind of you're seeing these great user cases, but I think kind of just taking a step back and, and playing with it and asking it the questions you want the answers to will kind of teach you how this technology adapts. And just another great example here, um, I love this example because I used to work on Burberry, so it was kind of applicable to me, but I think what I saw here is a creator basically looked at a potential brand collaboration. So this doesn't exist. This is just an AI kind of created experience and an AI brand uh, collaboration. And what they did, based on a text input of what if British Airways and Burberry partnered, they got some really high fidelity images. So this is all, this is all generated by AI, and it just gives you an idea as to the types of futures we're looking at with brands and travel organizations working together, use, like, utilizing the power of AI to kind of entice people. This would take someone hours, if not days, to create. So I think it's, again, really kind of like proving the power of this technology. But AI isn't just about kind of um, the front end and the user experience. It's also about how it's powering the back end to these types of platforms as well. So the example I have here is Hopper, which I didn't know about before I started putting this presentation together. But this is the number one downloaded travel app in the US. Some of you may know it. But what Hopper does is they basically utilize the power of AI to recommend when a traveler should be booking their flight. If we think again about the traditional model with advertising and digital advertising more so, it's not in the best interest of companies like TripAdvisor uh, or Booking.com for us to wait to make a book in. It's in their best interest that we click, we buy, and we put it in the basket and we go. And they make their kind of revenue share off that model. But what Hopper is allowing is it's utilizing machine learning to tell us when best to book our trips and best to book our travel. And I think that's a really interesting application because, again, as the trust kind of um, moves away from these bigger platforms that we've been using for the last 15 to 20 years to book our holidays. We're so institutionalized by that technology. This new technology is emerging. It's actually more truthful. It's based on fact. And I think we can trust it. I'm not sure right now, but I think it's something that's actually more trustworthy than what big technology has been doing to us for the last 15 to 20 years. And then lastly, just in this section, we have another app called Welcome. So. I spoke a little bit around kind of how social, uh, social media really has become kind of a storefront for travel as well. And obviously creators utilize social media to give people an experience of a place. In a way, I think some of us can agree that social media has actually ruined tourism a little because that art of discovery has really gone away. But what Welcome does is it kind of leans a little bit more into people actually in that booking stage of their trip to actually allow them to explore a space or a place before they go. And what they do is they utilize people on the ground, say in the city of Lisbon, to, to film their experience and to kind of record what they're doing, to then up, upload it back into the app. So then if I was coming here on holiday, I go to welcome, and I can see what there is to do through the lens of another traveler. Rather than it being the kind of glossy influencer experience, this is the true kind of experience of what is happening in that place at that time. And I think this is a really great example because I think the, the travel influencer, to my point, has kind of taken away that gloss of that discoverability of a place. But this really kind of takes away the gloss and it just allows us to see what's happening at a key moment. What are the greatest restaurants in that place, best cafes, et cetera, et cetera. So just to leave you with some thoughts, I think AR and VR, they're not going away. That technology is improving. The fidelity of it is just getting better. And if we think about the younger audiences, they start to emerge as kind of having that disposable income and start to travel. This is how they're discovering new experiences. So moving away from just thinking about the mobile as the place they go, it's thinking about headsets as well. Gamification of travel, um, again, more so on the Gen Alpha side of things. It's not about putting your kids in a kids' club anymore and them doing activities. It's actually allowing them to interact with technology on their travel uh, and actually experience a new place in a new way. Web-free technologies can be leveraged, 
Um, and what they can really allow us to do is kind of lean into that reward and participation piece for travel. And I gave you some examples there about different applications that are emerging in that space for that to happen. And then AI is really kind of changing how people shop for holidays. Again, it's very new, it's very glossy right now. But as we move into the world in the next two to three years, and that technology is embedded in everything that we do, I think it's going to be a really, really interesting thing for people to explore more. And for us in the travel and tourism industry, from a, a media perspective, it's just about thinking about that user or that customer journey in terms of how they book a holiday. How can we use AI to intercept those key moments, basically? And that's me. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. So much information, so important <laughs> trends like uh, uh, gamification, Web.3.0. Well, we have a lot of questions, but the time is running. And the challenge is two questions, two minutes. Could be? Sure. Do you accept? Yes? Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's do it. Uh, you have spent your career working in luxury, especially in this kind of brands as you show us, and with tech clients too developing their digital strategy and innovation roadmaps in media, especially in media space. Using your experience, tell us what's still missing in tourism. Yes, yeah, so I think from a luxury perspective, there's always that want and need to be ahead of the curve. Um, it's almost the most competitive vertical, um, if you think about media and advertising, where they're always trying to one-up one another and they have that hunger to achieve. So I think when we think about travel and tourism, it's about being brave to be the first to try these types of things. I think we all know about like the key kind of ingredients of innovation is to fail and fail fast, right? That's not saying everything that we do is just going to fail and we'll forget about it, but I think being brave and actually kind of being at the forefront of technology is really where most people want to be uh, at this moment. And I think from a luxury perspective, that's where all these brands are. Obviously, they have moments where they might not necessarily get things right, but at the same time, by pushing those innovations with key partners like your Googles, your Metas, um, your Snapchats, we're able to unlock these different types of experience and allow us to learn about like, what are the different types of things that younger audiences want to do. Um, so yeah, I think the main answer to that question is being brave and wanting to be at the forefront rather than kind of shying away and letting someone else do something first. Being brave, good message. <laughs> <laughs> the audience uh, wants to know more about Metaverse and uh, you show us the, the example of uh, Sandbox. Yep. Um, could you explain more? Well, yeah, how yeah. can we use more the Metaverse to be stronger, different and have more and more market? Sure, so I spent the last two and a half years playing around in that space, learning about it. I went really deep into that technology and I think Obviously, I don't know how many people here follow that space, but there's been a lot of negative PR around the kind of web free space over the last, say, six months. And I think it's good to compartmentalize different parts of that space. So cryptocurrencies and that side of things are one piece of the puzzle. I think we saw uh, a massive organization in the US called FTX get caught out basically uh, for embezzling money um, and it being a bit of a Ponzi scheme. And I think, again, it's important to compartmentalize that and think about the metaverse as those kind of immersive 3D experiences that we can create in the digital world. And from my experience, through the big example we had there like with the likes of Sandbox, what that's allowing for is us to move away from gaming just being like a one-way stream and, and allowing it to be much more immersive and people having ownership of assets and different experiences within, within that space. Um, I think, again, we, we love in advertising and digital media to hype up a technology and kind of all go all in on it and then move on to the next thing. Well, I think that's been a really good case in point with AI. We had Web3. People have almost put Web3 on the shelf again, and now they're leaning into AI. I think it's about understanding how all those technologies can be part of, uh, of an experience. And really, if we think about the metaverse as bringing in all those new technologies to create those more immersive experiences, for me, that's how I want to think of it. It's not just a single, like, single entity or a single metaverse opportunity. It's about building out all those different pieces of your immersive experiences, whether that be VR, AR, whether that be that Web3 layer and that reward through NFTs create that experience so that people can kind of dip in and out of the digital and the physical worlds to kind of really create a true 
kind of web free experience rather than it just being about I'm going to play a game because that's really not what it's about basically. Mm -hmm. And now a curiosity, do you ask to ChatGPT what they think about uh, the tourism in Portugal? Maybe we'll ask it later. Yeah, I haven't actually asked the question yet. But I, it, I think with ChatGPT, if you haven't played around with it, again, don't, don't, don't kind of shy away from it. It is just a search engine. Um, and what's really interesting, and we could probably have done a whole hour on ChatGPT, is you can have a conversation with it. So I obviously asked some very basic questions there. But if I asked a question about what's the future of tourism in Portugal, as I asked it, I could say, can you elaborate on point two around innovation? And it would then start to go into what types of innovation. And then I can go another layer and another layer. So you can really, it's like having a conversation with a real person. And I think because it's been so widely adopted, you have to be um, aware that you can't always get the best answer because of how much computing power it takes for these models to run. Um, and what they've actually started to do now, typically Microsoft, is they're going to uh, charge a subscription model for this type of service. So you actually have to pay for it. Similar to how you pay for your Netflix, you have to pay for this type of service. But what you get with that is better access to better kind of outputs. And what will eventually happen as well is they will have like an API solution where you take that technology and put it on your website. So I can go to the tourism board and I can, I can start having a conversation as if it's with someone here, but it's actually all the machine learning kind of telling me what are the best things to do there. Chris, thank you so much. You thank are you. a really machine of friends. Thank you so <laughs> thank much. Thank you. Appreciate <laughs> it. ChatGPT é um desafio, o nosso VCNL por vezes comete erros. Outro dia, num exercício muito simples sobre unicórnios, dava a receita toda sobre criar unicórnios em Portugal e como fazer, mas depois no final dizia que a maior parte vão à falência, não têm sucesso e não se impõem no mundo, o que não é verdade. Portanto, cuidado, nem sempre o ChatGPT dá a receita certa, exata e completa daquilo que pode ser uh, uh, o desafio ou a pergunta que nós lhe colocamos. É sem dúvida uma boa ferramenta de trabalho para explorar. Passamos agora ao debate, em velocidade acelerada, eu diria porque o almoço está entre o debate e a próxima sessão de encerramento. E neste debate que se segue vamos ter o tema especializar, escalar e internacionalizar. Três assuntos fundamentais, relevantes para o setor do turismo, que criam valor, que criam crescimento ao setor e às empresas em Portugal. Peço que se junte a mim neste palco, e depois vou ceder a outra moderadora a sessão que se segue, mas peço que se junte a mim neste palco o Danilo Cerqueira, CEO da Tempo VIP. Por favor, Danilo, bem-vindo. Miguel Assis, CCO da Vokin, que chamo também ao palco para o próximo debate e para moderar a minha cara colega moderadora deste painel, Lídia Monteiro, que é a Senior Director of Sales and Marketing do Turismo de Portugal. Uma boa sessão. Até já. Muito obrigada. Muito obrigada, Rosália. Este é um grande atrevimento da minha parte de moderar um painel depois na presença de uma profissional e, portanto, peço desde já a compreensão de todos, em particular do Danilo e do Miguel, um, e que, que são, uh, aliás, uh, uh, representantes de, de, digamos assim, de, dos de profissionais de turismo, neste caso, uh, o, o Danilo, uh, um DMC especializado uh, no segmento de luxo, e o Miguel no mais representam, digamos, as empresas de turismo que estão aqui já há alguns, alguns anos no mercado, têm na vossa, na vossa carteira de trabalho os olhos postos nos mercados internacionais, seja quando levam lá fora os vossos produtos aos operadores e às agências de viagens, mas também um, quando são, se instalam lá fora com uh, escritórios ou com uh, empresas. Um, a diversificação de produtos e de segmentos e de mercados tem sido uma aposta uh, do turismo em Portugal e também uh, das empresas portuguesas que se internacionalizam e que, uh, de alguma forma, este, uh, essa aposta é um reflexo Uh, no portfólio de mercados que hoje em dia uh, procuram o destino de Portugal, que, que é claramente mais alargado e é diferente daquele que tínhamos anteriormente. Uh, a diversificação da nossa oferta turística uh, tem também sido uh, relevante, uh, mas muitas vezes ouvimos falar que os operadores uh, e as agências nos mercados externos que não uh, dispõem uh, desses produtos uh, diferenciados que Portugal tem para oferecer. Danilo, comece por si. 
a base do seu negócio é justamente o produto diferenciado e personalizado. É verdade ou é um mito que o que referem os operadores e as agências nos mercados de que não lhes chega até eles os produtos diferenciados que Portugal oferece? Como é que faz o seu trabalho? o seu trabalho de pesquisa e de curadoria da oferta nacional e que soluções é que encontra e como é que essa presença ao seu cliente. Então, antes de mais, muito obrigado pelo convite. É um prazer estar aqui e dividir um pouco daquilo que tem sido a história da Tempo VIP e aquilo que nós temos feito enquanto empresa. E é verdade não é, né? é porque é, é verdade que existe muita oferta, é verdade que existem players no mercado que de facto promovem essa oferta, mas quando nós falamos do, principalmente da, da grande tour operação que vem para Portugal, ela está maioritariamente concentrada nos grandes eixos de Lisboa, Porto, Algarve, Madeira e a maior parte da oferta diversificada que nós temos está justamente em locais que não estão, que não são dentro desses eixos, está, está na região região centro, está no Alentejo, está no Baixo Alentejo, no Alto Alentejo, está nos Açores e esses grandes operadores normalmente não levam a tour operação para, essa, para essas regiões. Então, acaba por ser verdade, mas não porque não haja vontade, é que acho que é uma questão mais operacional e comercial e de opções comerciais do que necessariamente de impossibilidade ou de falta de ferramentas. Como é, que, como é que faz o seu trabalho de curadoria e de pesquisa da oferta nacional e como é que a leva até lá fora? Essa história é bem engraçada que começou em 2010. Né? Em 2010 começamos a falar sobre a palavra experiência. Todo mundo queria vender experiência, todo mundo queria comprar experiência, todo mundo queria fazer experiência, mas poucas pessoas dentro do trade, embora já exista bastante matéria estudada, matéria acadêmica sobre a questão, de facto pensava o que é que a palavra experiência significava. Então nós fomos fazer pesquisas internamente e criamos ali um mote sobre o qual desenvolvemos todo o nosso portfólio e esse mote assentava em três pilares básicos. Primeiro que a experiência tinha a ver com a essência. Né? O que é que existe num lugar, numa vila, numa aldeia, num restaurante, numa ponte numa árvore que é único e que só existe ali. Aquilo é o um motivo para alguém ir lá ver e conhecer aquela coisa. Essa essência depois tinha que ser tangível, né? tinha que estar associada a algum dos cinco sentidos e ali nós teríamos um potencial produto turístico. E o último e mais importante era a contextualização porque levar um cliente para poder fazer um workshop junto dos paliteiros de Mirandela era algo fantástico, se ele percebesse toda a história, estivesse lá em Mirandela, mas se eu pegasse... Mirando do Douro. Mirando do Douro, sim, <risos> desculpa. Mas se eu pegasse o mesmo, o mesmo, a mesma atividade, o mesmo workshop, e colocasse ele na... <coughs> no lobby do Hotel Cinco Estrelas em Lisboa, iria perder 80% da sua essência, já não seria a mesma coisa. E ao mesmo tempo que o facto de uh, promover uh, os pauliteiros lá em Miranda do Douro e levar o cliente para lá, iria não só agregar valor, como iria fazer com que eu deslocasse o cliente e fazer com que ele uh, gastasse mais no destino. Então, acabou por ser uma consequência natural e a partir daí, com essa base, começamos a desenvolver uh, portfólios com coisas que, teoricamente, até são básicas, mas quando você encontra o cliente certo para o produto certo, aquilo ganha uma dimensão e tem um valor que, de facto, é inestimável. Então, depois de encontrar um portfólio com quase 400 experiências em Portugal inteiro, fomos perceber como é que levávamos isso para quem valorizava esse produto e estava disposto a fazer os 500 quilômetros para fazer o workshop de, de lá em Miranda do Douro. <risos> Imagino que seja difícil uh, transportar essa experiência uh, quando está no seu processo de, de, de venda junto do seu cliente. Como é que, como é que, como é que concretiza? Um, isso também tem a ver com, com, com uma outra teoria, que é, normalmente as pessoas, antes de viajar, elas têm sempre um mapa mental, né? Eu acho que, que poucas pessoas aqui é, têm intenção de viajar para o Burkina Faso, não porque não acha interessante, mas porque não tem a mínima ideia do que é que aquilo é. Né? Então, a, a nossa percepção sobre a viagem acaba por ser moldada por um mosaico de informações que é criada ao longo do tempo, até que chega o ponto aonde todo aquele mosaico começa a ganhar alguma alguma consistência que se reflete no desejo de ir para algum lugar. Mas até esse momento ainda estamos a falar de uma coisa pouco definida. Então, e aí começamos a pesquisa, vamos ver qual é, que é o hotel que tem lá, qual é, que é a experiência de gastronomia, de natureza, de acordo com os nossos anseios e com os nossos desejos. E percebemos nós que um, acelerar esse processo 
uh, facilitava não só todo o processo de venda, como também agregava valor, porque a percepção de valor que o cliente tem sobre aquilo que vai fazer aumenta no momento que eu estou a decidir e por isso estou disposto a gastar uma parte do meu budget na experiência X ou Y. E nós encontramos, nesse caso, fizemos um benchmark muito simples, um, que são os vídeos, né? se você pensar nos influencers do, das redes sociais, uh, normalmente a maior parte deles, não, falando, não colocando todos aqui, a maior parte deles não são especialistas no destino, a maior parte deles nem conhecem muito bem o destino, mas eles têm um poder incrível junto da audiência por um único motivo, produzem informação como as pessoas querem consumir. Né? Nós temos muita informação, nós somos especialistas, mas não adianta ter informação se não temos formas corretas de partilhar. E a forma com que nós próprios consumimos informação mudou, mas a nossa indústria tem ainda um caminho longuíssimo a percorrer em se adaptar. A, a transformar todo o conhecimento e bagagem que nós já temos da forma eficiente com que todos nós atualmente cons consumimos informação na sociedade. Resumindo tudo isso, fizemos vídeos de 40 ou 50 segundos sobre quase todas as experiências para mostrar para o cliente que está a 10, 15 mil quilômetros de distância exatamente o que é que ele pode esperar quando opta, por exemplo, por fazer um passeio de balão Uh, no, no Alentejo. Até temos um vídeo para poder mostrar como é que a gente convence alguém que está no Minnesota a ir para o interior do Alentejo e gastar 2 mil euros no passeio de balão. Vamos ver então. Ou seja, em 50 segundos temos o storytelling que mostra para o cliente exatamente o que é que ele vai ter e encontramos depois formas de colocar essa informação na frente do cliente final quando ele está optando pela compra e obviamente a percepção de valor dele sobre aquilo que vai ser a experiência e a vinda para Portugal altera da noite para o dia, porque não dependemos de mais ninguém para poder transmitir a mensagem sobre o valor agregado que nós uh, aportamos à cadeia. Imagino que os seus clientes acabam por uh, ter uma ideia mais concreta das experiências. Tem 400 experiências, dizia o Danilo? Sim, 420 atualmente e crescendo, que é, nunca, é um never-end story, né? felizmente. <risos> Miguel, o segmento mais é um segmento uh, muito exigente, uh, mas também muito relevante para crescer em valor no turismo, de qualquer destino turístico. Um, é um segmento no qual o Miguel trabalha já há alguns anos e que Portugal tem também crescido e tem sido também uma referência, e particularmente a alguns locais no nosso país. O mais exige criatividade, exige saber fazer e saber fazer bem, serviço. Um, Conte-nos um pouco, partilhe connosco, como é que o Miguel, na Vokin, com a vossa equipa, uh, fazem uh, este produto e como é que o levam lá fora aos clientes. Bom, Lídia, primeiro agradecer a oportunidade também de estar aqui, partilhar este painel com, com o Danilo, que já conheço há uns anos. A Vokin nasceu há 20 anos e, e, na realidade, nós crescemos e começamos a ser exigentes com nós, com nós próprios. Eu acho que o mercado é exigente por si só, uh, quer a melhor experiência, e agora podemos divagar aqui muito do que é que é uma experiência, mas eles quando investem, e aqui há uma grande diferença entre o, o mercado mais e o mercado uh, uh, de FITs, de luxo, de individuais, porque eu enquanto individual invisto na minha própria experiência, sei para aquilo que estou a pagar, no mundo mais, eu exijo ainda mais porque alguém me está a levar para algum lado e está-me a tirar da zona de conforto, quer seja família, quer seja o meu dia-a-dia, -dia, vou eventualmente ter que fazer as minhas tarefas do dia-a-dia -dia noutra altura e, portanto, a exigência é ainda maior. 
ou pelo menos assim o deveria ser. E essa exigência é saudável, porque essa exigência é que nos faz de alguma forma também crescermos. Eu acho que o turismo em Portugal tem feito um trabalho fantástico nos últimos anos, tem sido exigente consigo próprio também em criar mais eh, divulgação lá fora e os frutos estão aí. Não só do turismo em Portugal, mas todos aqueles que fazemos parte, por assim dizer, de, de, dessa divulgação, os agentes eh, de turismo, os hoteleiros, eh, todos têm feito um trabalho eh, fantástico, que pode sempre ser melhor, daí vem essa tal palavra exigência. A exigência vai sempre, há sempre melhor que podemos fazer. E um ponto que eu acho que realmente nós podíamos ser mais exigentes com nós próprios é sermos mais associativos. Ou seja, nós trabalhamos mais em conjunto e não tanto para nós próprios. É um, é um bocadinho uma, uma dificuldade dos 20 anos que tenho uh, desta indústria. Eu venho de uma indústria que não tem nada a ver, que é a engenharia, uh, mas sempre disse que a minador de Portugal estava no turismo. Portanto, de alguma forma, acabo por estar aqui inserido dentro do meu meio. Em termos de criatividade, eu acho que as pessoas realmente falam muito sobre criatividade, mas o que é criativo para mim não é a mesma coisa para a Lida e não é a mesma coisa para o Danilo. E isso nós só conseguimos entender qual é que é o verdadeiro né, objetivo de cada um dos vindores a Portugal se os ouvirmos uh, e, e posicionarmos não tanto numa, de uma forma eu tenho agora muito vinho para vender, agora também temos experiências de, de, de azeite. O que é que as pessoas querem? O que é que é aquilo que realmente lhes impacta uh, uh, para que elas saiam daqui de Portugal ou de qualquer outro destino uh, com memórias para o resto da vida? Porque isso é que vai fazer com que as pessoas queiram falar sobre essa tal experiência. Acho que este trabalho que o Danilo está a fazer em termos de, destes vídeos uh, é, é fantástico e é muito importante. Os vídeos também de Portugal e do Turismo de Portugal têm ganho prémios uh, pelo mundo fora porque são muito importantes. Nós, durante a pandemia, desenvolvemos, ou seja, pusemos dentro de um processo aquilo que nós já fazíamos antigamente, que é um emotional thinking process, ou seja, um processo de como é que nós criamos emoção a quem vem aqui. E a primeira parte da emoção tem a ver com aquilo que o Danilo fez através dos vídeos, que é a criar a curiosidade. E isto é muito rápido. Ou seja, eu quando estou a passar numa feira, porquê é que eu vou direto ao stand de Portugal e não vou de Espanha? tem a ver com o design, é uma coisa que é captada pela, pela nossa visão e é muito rápido, é uma mensagem muito rápida que nós temos um curto espaço de tempo para dar. Acho que estes vídeos, todos agora queremos ir andar de balão, passam essa mensagem. A segunda parte deste emotional thinking process é como é que nós criamos o engagement. Nós não usamos aqui o engajamento aqui como palavra em Portugal, mas este engagement é feito através depois do contacto pessoal. Uh, Uh, podemos ter uma paleta de uma série de experiências que podemos fazer, mas uh, primeiramente a segunda parte passa por ouvir, escutar muito. A terceira então vem o conteúdo, não é? que é, é realmente quando as pessoas passam a conhecer o produto e por fim o que nós queremos é que as pessoas sejam todas embaixadoras do nosso produto. Falem de, de Portugal em geral, falem da Volkswagen em particular uh, e que, que venha mais negócio, não porque nós estamos a vender, mas porque quem já experimentou passou uh, a vender. Portanto, todo este processo exige nós sermos exigentes com nós, nós próprios, sermos humildes para não acharmos que temos o um melhor produto, há sempre alguém que pode ter melhor do que nós, e também não acharmos que vamos inventar a roda. Os produtos estão cá, as 400 experiências do Danilo estão lá, quantas mais experiências, quanto mais nós ouvimos, quanto mais sabemos também do que é que os outros países estão a fazer, mais a nossa caixa das ferramentas é maior para quando houver uma oportunidade nós temos essa capacidade de entregar o que o cliente quer comprar e não aquilo que nós queremos vender. Aliás, de norte a sul do país, incluindo as nossas ilhas, temos feito coletivamente, quando digo temos porque é coletivamente, Uh, tem aparecido uh, oferta muito diversificada, desde o enoturismo, a gastronomia uh, e outras que irão uh, surgindo com alguma força, como o turismo literário, mas acima de tudo um, propostas muito concretas, como falava aqui o Danilo, que têm que ver muitas vezes com uh, expressões uh, da nossa cultura e da nossa, uh, da nossa história, que são essas expressões que dão autenticidade e genuinidade uh, ao destino e depois também uh, 
mais valor às propostas que vocês acabam por construir. Eu suponho que estes produtos integram os vossos portfólios, de uma maneira ou de outra, da forma, da forma como os vossos clientes vos vão pedindo, e, e por isso perguntava como é que, e era uma pergunta para ambos, como é que sentem que são recebidos, como é que são recepcionados lá fora estas propostas, e também como é que competem com de outros DMCs de outros destinos, porque no final do dia o que vocês fazem lá fora é estarem a competir justamente com DMCs de outros destinos que estão eles próprios também a apresentar propostas de uma forma competitiva de outros, de outros países. Como é que isso se processa? Eu, 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 Lídia, eu acho que isso é super importante porque eu não houve uma apresentação de um destino que o destino não dissesse que era o melhor destino do mundo. Pois. Tinha as melhores praias do mundo e, e uma história fantástica, ou seja, onde é que está aqui os USPs? Onde é que está aqui a, aquilo que nos faz ser diferentes enquanto destino de Portugal no geral e enquanto regiões autónomas, porque cada região tem a sua autenticidade. E dito isto, há muitas experiências que no caso do MAIS nós eventualmente nunca as vamos poder explorar da mesma forma que, por exemplo, o, os, o turismo individual pode, mas o turismo individual tem quase esse dever, por assim dizer, de fazê-lo bem e promover porque o mais acaba por, de alguma forma, ganhar com isto. O que é que eu quero dizer? A colaboração que estava a falar o orador antes, de nós sermos cada vez mais, percebemos todo, tudo, quais é que são todos os players dentro do mercado, eu, eu penso que se o Danilo fizer um bom trabalho, e se eu puder ajudar o Danilo a fazer um bom trabalho, em cada CEO que vem aqui, ou decision maker das grandes corporações, eventualmente essa pessoa vai pensar que se calhar a próxima viagem de incentivo, o próximo congresso, a próxima conferência, vem a Portugal. Ou seja, muitas vezes os projetos quando chegam a nós, eles têm já uma base, uh, uh, em termos de o que é que é a mensagem que se quer passar para cada um destes, uh, uh, para as audiências mais extensas do que as audiências do, do, do individual, e, e como é que nós de alguma forma uh, podemos pôr algumas dessas experiências. Um, não é tão fácil uh, e, e seria uh, incorreto da minha parte dizer agora vamos todos vender uh, experiências de vinho no Douro, até porque a capacidade muitas vezes uh, em alguns desses lugares uh, inusitados e, e, e que são diferentes não tem a capacidade que um, um evento uh, mais se necessita. Uh, de qualquer das formas, uh, uh, está presente dentro da nossa comunicação, partilhar essas ideias, porque às vezes por um bocadinho uma pequena experiência conseguimos trazer um evento grande e acho que o Danilo aqui tem um papel ainda mais importante do que o nosso. Sim, no nosso caso, obviamente competir com, com Itália, com França, é sempre o nosso cocanhar de Aquiles, não é uma tarefa fácil, mas é a tarefa que a gente consegue dar a volta com criatividade e com eficiência. Acho que são essas duas grandes palavras, porque... Eu posso não ter um, uma vila que é um castelo full staffed que custa 80 mil euros por dia, porque sim, há produtos como esse, tem um cliente que me pede e em Portugal não existe, mas aquilo que é luxo é muito específico. Né? O luxo tem muito a ver com as motivações, com os desejos, com o anseio, com aquilo que você não tem no dia a dia. E hum, o que nós fazemos passa muito por utilizar as ferramentas que nós temos para conseguir, de uma forma muito eficiente e muito rápida, porque o timing também conta muito nessa questão, algo que, do outro lado, o cliente acha que é exclusivo. Ou seja, todo o nosso processo está muito mais focado naquilo que são os valores do cliente do que aquilo que é a oferta nacional. Porque a oferta, como o Miguel disse, pouco interessa. Eu tentar vender a melhor, uh, a melhor vinícola, um, wine, wine Experience, do Alentejo, se o cliente não bebe, ou seja, não valoriza vinho. Então, aqui é o que é que ele move, o que é que ele acha que é importante e o que é que vai fazer ele escolher Portugal em detrimento de outros destinos. Vamos pegar a melhor versão dessas coisas e colocar em um itinerário de uma forma extremamente eficiente, de uma forma extremamente apelativa e, certamente, vamos estar a par a par com qualquer outro destino europeu, independente de termos ou não a tal vila de 80 mil euros a diária. A pergunta é, quem é que são os clientes que são os clientes certos para Portugal? Até dependendo da sazonalidade, não é? Ou seja, nós, por exemplo, na área do desporto e de alto rendimento, 
Uh, nós temos, o, em termos de, 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 de tempo, zonas do país que são fantásticas para promover para certos tipos de clientes que, por exemplo, estão na região nórdica de, de Europa ou, ou países que não têm a mesma facilidade, por exemplo, para estar a jogar golfe durante o ano inteiro. Uh, o que, que, será que Portugal deve promover para todos os, o, o tipo de clientes? Será que todas as regiões devem promover para todo o tipo de clientes? O que é que estes clientes querem? O que é que diz esta cultura? Porque uma coisa é nós analisarmos o cliente de uma forma demográfica, uh, quer seja pela raça, uh, uh, cultura, uh, 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 pela, pela religião, o que é que seja, Até género, por aí fora. Uh, podemos também analisar de uma forma psicológica, que é aquilo que eles já fizeram, aquilo que eles gostaram, e que nos dá um historial do que é que eh, realmente foi feito em experiências anteriores em outros destinos, mas depois há uma parte que é parte dos valores, e que nós cada vez mais temos que entrar nesta, neste, neste segmento. Quais é que são os valores para cada tipo de determinado de cultura? Porque esses valores vai -nos, vai nos dar oportunidade não só de nós dizermos que temos uma praia fantástica e temos um tempo fantástico, mas nós falarmos daquilo que a pessoa leva na sua vida, no dia-a-dia, -dia, como aquilo mais importante. Família, dinheiro, a, 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 a saúde, bem-estar, quais é que são os valores principais? Eu ouvi um, um speaker a falar há pouco de tempo, há umas semanas em Nova York e acho que há 56 valores que estão uh, de, de, definidos. Dentro desses 56 valores, o que é que cada uma destas potenciais clientes tem? E quais é que são os valores que Portugal tem para oferecer? E depois então percebemos aqui qual é que é o match. Aí vamos estar a falar para as emoções, aí vamos estar a falar para as memórias e aquilo que realmente vai atrair cada um destes uh, potenciais clientes. E nessa sequência, um recente estudo referia justamente que a responsabilidade social e corporativa é apontada como um dos desafios... Um, mais, mais importantes para, para a indústria designadamente na indústria do luxo mas também para a indústria do mais e, e que isso é sem dúvida um dos aspectos que as empresas cada vez mais têm que incorporar nas suas, nas suas ações e nas suas iniciativas como é que interpretam este diagnóstico e como é que integram, no fundo, este desafio de responsabilidade social uh, e, e ambiental também uh, nas vossas propostas? Posso? Eu acho que vai, vai. É. Então, acho que primeiro um, é preciso, toda vez que a gente faz um diagnóstico, parece que a gente tem que ter uma solução imediata para ele. Né? Então, vê, vê que está errado, tem que ter uma solução certa. E, na verdade, os diagnósticos são o primeiro passo para a gente começar a fazer alguma coisa em direção ao mundo ideal, em direção a minimizar aqueles impactos. E é dessa forma que nós encaramos a sustentabilidade. Né? Obviamente que a gente poderia ter feito muito mais, mas o facto é que a consciencialização, a preocupação, é algo que é relativamente recente. Né? A palavra sustentabilidade, a assim, agregado ao turismo, só surgiu depois da experiência. Há 10 anos atrás, estou muito preocupado com experiência, ninguém está preocupado com sustentabilidade. Agora, virou a palavra da moda e, mais uma vez, a gente acha que tem que ter resposta, mas sem, sem pensar muito em como é que as coisas... E é um processo. E o facto de termos tido o diagnóstico já é o um meio caminho andado. Como é que nós, o que é que nós fazemos? Ok, uma vez diagnosticado, nós temos que, de facto, tomar alguma ação e fazer algumas coisas. Posso falar nós, enquanto empresa, por exemplo, principalmente agora... É, vamos falar, né? Os últimos dois anos para trás não conta. Mas esse ano, por exemplo, 2022, nós tivemos duas ações, que acho que foram duas ações uh, que já caminham nesse sentido. Uma foi na altura do Natal, que decidimos uh, não dar, uh, que decidimos uh, uh, entrar em parceria com todos. Uma coisa super simples, né? Nós vendemos para muitos hotéis, vendemos para muitos fornecedores e falamos para eles, olha, ao invés de darmos pre presentes para os nossos colaboradores, eu preciso que vocês me deem, eu vou fazer com uma parceria, vocês vão me dar vouchers. E para cada voucher que vocês me derem 100 euros, nós vamos atribuir para uma atividade de iniciativa, uh, iniciativa social. Fizemos uma parceria com o Rifoxi, que é um movimento da ONU uh, que um, trabalha com igualdade, igualdade de gênero. E fizemos uma ação no bairro Padre Cruz, antes do Natal. Levamos uh, ginecologistas, levamos psicólogas, uh, fizemos uma atividade, fizemos conscientização de pobreza menstrual, fizemos uma série de coisas. E a própria nossa equipa foi lá fazer parte daquilo e depois ainda assim receberam um presente uh, de Natal que na verdade foram os vouchers uh, em colaboração 
colaboração com todos os nossos parceiros. Isso é um exemplo super prático de uma coisa simples, que na verdade nós só começamos a pensar nisso depois que o assunto veio para cima da mesa. A sustentabilidade econômica, vimos alguns fornecedores, principalmente em regiões que não é Lisboa e Porto, no Algarve, por exemplo, na ilha da Culatra, né? temos lá a prova de ostras na fazenda de ostras um, e entretanto aquilo era com um preço relativamente baixo, a senhora cobrava sei lá, 16, 17 euros para comer umas ostras que se fossem em França estariam custando 150 euros cada ostra daquela e nós falamos, olha, não pode ser assim vamos uh, vamos levar uma garrafa de espumante, vamos fazer pequenos add-ons para que então esse trabalho de consultoria permitiu ela deixar de vender a ostra a, a 7, 8 euros e ter um produto a 70 euros também é responsabilidade nossa, porque eu quero que ela seja uh, ganhe dinheiro com aquilo que ela está fazendo para continuar a fazer aquilo daquela forma para o máximo de tempo possível. Porque a 7 euros, daqui a nada, ela vai ter que receber grupos grandes. Então, acho que todas essas ideias surgem do debate da como é que nós implementamos a sustentabilidade nas suas várias vertentes, naquilo que é o nosso DNA e o fato de já começarmos a pensar nisso e, e, e fazermos pequenas ações, já é o começo para daqui a quatro ou cinco anos isso já ser mesmo um, um dos pilares fortes da empresa. E os clientes pedem-vos também eh, que incorporem nas vossas propostas algumas eh, atividades relacionadas com a eh, responsabilidade social ou ambiental? Sim, responsabilidade social em Portugal é mais complicado, né? felizmente temos um Estado que tem, tem, tem assistência e, e você colocar toda a operação, todo o time é, é um bocado mais complicado, mas nós temos um mote que nós passamos para o cliente que é thank you helping us, helping others e todas as vezes que nós temos alguma ação como essa, comunicamos para a nossa base de cliente, o que lhes dá também uma ideia de que nós, não só nós estamos a fazer, mas que o facto de ter optado por comprar as coisas conosco tem um reflexo e nós estamos a dar retorno para a comunidade que nos permite existir. Eu acho que, quer dizer, isto é um tema que, mais do que um tema do, do dia, ou, ou, de, ou, ou que pudesse alguma vez ser utilizado como imagem de marca, devia ser uma coisa que nos devia ser inerente. É, cada um fazer um bocadinho daquilo que lhe está na sua mão para melhorar tanto a nossa sociedade como o nosso ambiente. É, e, eu, e, e nós, enquanto empresa, fazemos isso há muitos anos. É, não vou estar aqui a falar sobre os projetos que nós apoiamos e tudo mais, porque isso também depende da necessidade de cada um dos projetos que nós trazemos, mas nós fazemos isso internamente. Porque se nós não sabemos viver a responsabilidade social, primeiro enquanto pessoa, segundo enquanto grupo que nos está ao meu lado, como é que nós vamos passar essa mensagem? É só porque fica bonito, não tem sentido. E a responsabilidade social passa também, nos dias que hoje estão, e esse devia ser o tema da responsabilidade social, é, nós estamos neste momento numa indústria em que há muita falta de mão de obra. Há muita falta de mão de obra porque as pessoas nem sequer já se interessam estar aqui, os jovens querem fazer outras coisas, é estressante, é mal pago, exige horas extras e tudo mais. Qual é que é a responsabilidade social que nós estamos a ter na sociedade da indústria do, do, de, de turismo para que eh, as pessoas cada vez sejam mais respeitadas pelo trabalho que eles são feitos. E aproveito, agradeço a toda a equipa de audiovisuais, hospedeiras, que estão aqui, porque sem eles nós também não estávamos aqui neste palco, muitas vezes eles não têm a palavra, têm a luz e o som. Eh, portanto, obrigado a todos por, 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 pelo trabalho que estão a fazer no backstage. Mas a responsabilidade social passa por, quando eu tenho um pedido de um cliente, perceber qual é que é realmente a necessidade do cliente, e não mandar um pedido para 10 hotéis porque eu não estou a ser socialmente responsável a exigir que parceiros estejam a trabalhar por uma coisa que nunca, nunca iria ser ganho. Da mesma forma, eu enquanto agência, quando estou a, a responder a uma proposta, também para fazer essa pergunta ao cliente. Quantos destinos estão à, à, à concorrência? Quantas uh, agências estão à concorrência? Porque se o cliente de repente faz uma concorrência, e nós adoramos concorrência, uh, de 10 destinos, é porque ele nem sequer sabe o que é que quer. E, portanto, ele tem que ir fazer o trabalho de casa dele. Uh, eventualmente passa por ele estudar um bocadinho aquilo que o turismo de Portugal uh, uh, põe uh, em termos de materiais e depois, quando quiser uma parte mais detalhada, estaremos cá nós para trabalhar isso. Responsabilidade social passa por saber o que é que nós fazemos do nosso tempo. Porque, lá está, se nós estamos um, a utilizar o tempo para coisas que, na realidade, acabam por não ser efetivadas, 
estamos a gastar energia, em termos de sustentabilidade ambiental não funciona, estamos a gastar tempo das pessoas com uma coisa que não lhes vai trazer mais valia nenhuma, estamos-lhe a tirar tempo de ócio para poderem estar com as famílias, fazer os seus lobbies, e que hoje está a criar um problema gigante, que todos sabemos isso, que é tema do dia, que é nerve breaks, problemas psicológicos, e faz parte de nós, dentro da nossa indústria, percebemos qual é que é o nosso papel social para minimizar estes problemas que nós hoje temos grandes na nossa indústria. Antes de nós começarmos a olhar para tudo, a sociedade passa fome, os doentes de cancro e tudo mais, vamos primeiro pôr-nos a nós saudáveis e depois então nós podemos ajudar os outros. Nós temos muita tendência de olhar muito para o longe e olhar muito pouco para o perto. Ao contrário, depois, quando é aquelas coisas da, do associativismo, que olhamos muito para o umbigo e olhamos muito pouco para o associativismo. Neste caso, eu acho que nós, hoje, temos que nos preocupar com a nossa indústria uh, do turismo, olhar por nós, olhar para aqueles que uh, a fizeram crescer durante tantos anos, tornar-a sustentável outra vez, portanto, então depois podemos usar outras, outras partes da sociedade. Miguel e Danilo, a nossa conversa já ultrapassou o tempo que estava definido. A nossa, teríamos aqui, naturalmente, pano para mangas, havia muitos outros temas que poderíamos uh, aqui abordar, uh, mas julgo que uh, pelo menos tentámos uh, falar sobre o essencial. Teremos, naturalmente, muito mais tempo para, noutros fóruns, poder conversar e podermos falar ainda mais sobre os desafios que esta indústria tem. Muito obrigada a ambos por partilharem a vossa experiência e obrigado a todos. Obrigado. obrigado. Muito bem.